Good morning. I'm Council Member Margaret Chin. I will be chairing this committee today due to an unforeseen circumstance with Chair Debbie Rose. Uh, this morning, we will be hearing three bills all related to runaway and homeless youth. The bills address one, extending time limits for youth to remain in runaway and homeless youth shelters. Second, requiring the Department of Youth and Community Development, DYCD, to report information about the runaway and homeless youth population and to develop a plan to provide shelter to all runaway and homeless youth who request it. And third, requiring DYCD to provide runaway and homeless youth services to homeless youth adult, young adults, which are age 21 to 24. I would first like to thank our speaker, Corey Johnson, for his strong commitment to this issue. He has shown great support and has worked tirelessly to address problems related to runaway and homeless youth throughout the city. I would also like to thank all the young people, advocates, and providers who are here today to testify on behalf of these bills as well as acknowledge my colleagues who have joined us this morning. Uh, we have our speaker, Corey Johnson, here, and also uh, Council Member Justin Brennan. In recent years, homelessness in general within New York City has reached the highest level since the Great Depression of the 1930s. Of those homeless runaway and homeless youth are an increasingly vulnerable population that require a vast array of services. According to the mayor's management report, in fiscal year 2017, DYCD-funded programs for one array and homeless youth served 25,993 youth, with that number likely to be even greater with those who have not received services. Runaway and homeless youth are typically defined as youth with unstable or inadequate housing, youth who stay at least one night in a place that is not their home, youth who have run away from their home, or youth who have stayed in a shelter, outdoors, or in an unstable living environment. Some youth may find themselves homeless due to family conflict, a lack of available affordable housing, and or family poverty. In addition, youth run away from home due to reasons which commonly include violence, abuse, or neglect at their home, mental illness, or substance abuse among their family members, and or challenges at school. Due to the, despite the increase in the number of runaway and homeless youth beds over the past several years, New York City currently lacks the capacity to fully serve this population. Runaway and homeless youth experience high rate of physical, emotional, and sexual abuse that, compounded with poverty and unstable housing, result in higher level of trauma, higher rates of mental illness, and higher rates of substance abuse. This makes it much harder for this population to rise up out of their circumstance and become becoming fully housed, employed, and assimilated into the general population. Currently, shelters and other services for runaway and homeless youth are under the jurisdiction of the Department of Youth and Community Development, DYCD, which provides services including transitional independent living facilities, crisis centers, and drop-in centers with specialized programming for runaway and homeless youth who are pregnant, parenting, sexually exploited, and or LGBTQ. These services greatly help this vulnerable population. However, there are still major gaps in services that let many runaway and homeless youth fall through the cracks and remain homeless. The three bills being heard today will help redo these gaps in runaway and homeless youth services while also working towards a reduction in the homeless population. In addition, these bills will better identify just how many runaway and homeless youth are in the city, as well as identify areas in which runaway and homeless youth desperately need services. I would like to thank the community council staff for their work today to prepare for today's hearing. Our council, Paul Senegal, 
policy analyst Kevin Kachowski and finance analyst Jessica Ackerman. I also like my thank my Deputy Chief of Staff Vincent Fang for the work on preparing this hearing. And right now I will ask our speaker, Corey Johnson, to provide some opening remarks. Thank you. Uh, good morning. <clears throat> I am uh, Council Member Corey Johnson, Speaker of the New York City Council, and I'd like to thank the Committee on Youth Services for holding today's hearing on the three bills that we are hearing to improve services provided to runaway and homeless youth. I would like to thank Councilmember Margaret Chin, a member of the Youth Services Committee, for being able to chair this hearing in the chair's absence, who unfortunately is unable to attend today. I'd also like to start today's hearing by thanking all of those who are here to testify in support of these bills, including the service providers, I see Cost Siliano out there, uh, who are on the front lines of providing RHY youth with essential services, and most importantly, the young people themselves who are here to speak about their experiences with homelessness. I'm proud to be a sponsor of a bill that we are considering today to develop a plan to provide shelter to every single youth who needs it. I'm also the co-sponsor of a bill that Councilmember Vanessa Gibson uh, is, has introduced to extend the amount of time youth are permitted to remain in shelter. <clears throat> and a bill by Councilman Richie Torres to extend the age of young people who can access RHY shelters from 21 up to 24 years old. No person should ever have to sleep on the streets, yet runaway and homeless youth continue to account for one of the most vulnerable populations in our city. As I have said publicly before, the word vulnerable doesn't even come close to fully describing the gruesome reality of physical, mental, emotional, and sexual abuse that can occur to youth who are forced to live out on our streets. So much more has to be done to help them, and these three bills are, vi are a vital step to providing the information and services that these young people need. For years, there has been trouble identifying and pinpointing the runaway and homeless youth population throughout the city, and that is why requiring DYCD to report information about the RHY population will not only help us develop, but deliver programs that uplift these young people, including creating a plan to provide shelter to all runaway and homeless youth who request it. Similarly, DYCD uh, would be required to provide RHY shelter services to homeless young adults, those aged 21 to 24, and that will help address the daunting challenges experienced by those who age out of our current system under antiquated age restrictions that halt the specialized support provided by RHY programs up to the age of 21. And finally, requiring DYCD to extend the time youth may remain in shelters to conform with the maximum times permitted under state law will ensure that our youth are not kicked back out onto the streets prematurely. I look forward to working with everyone in this room, the administration, the providers, the advocates, and the youth who work together and help give other folks and young adults some semblance of what a supportive home is really like. I want to recognize that we are joined today by a former council member, Lou Fiddler, who has been a tremendous champion on this issue for years and years and years. My uh, first day that I was voted in as speaker, I had uh, an inordinate number of texts from him saying, when are you having a hearing on RHY? And then three phone calls and emails and a carrier pigeon uh, to, to make sure that we got this done quickly. So he was a champion for years on this issue in the council. Even though he is no longer in the council, he remains a champion and someone who still continues to do this work for runaway and homeless youth and with the providers that do this work throughout the city. And I am really, I wanna reiterate, I'm really grateful uh, for the young people who are here today, who are here to talk about their experiences and to be here on behalf of other young people who can't be here today for whatever reason. Uh, of course, we're gonna hear from the administration and what they have to say is important, but the most important testimony that we will hear today, and I'm gonna do my best to be here for it, it's a bit of a crazy day, uh, is the young people who are here um, to, to talk about why these bills are important and I look forward to working with all of you. And then lastly, I mentioned it before, but I wanna say it again, uh, Carl Siciliano has been a champion on these issues for years, if not decades, though he doesn't look that old. So I don't know, it could be decades. 
And before I was elected to the city council, I was on the board of the LA Fournay Center, and I'm really grateful and proud of all the work that he does. So I want to turn it over to Councilmember Vanessa Gibson, who is going to provide an opening statement on her bill that is being heard today. And again, I want to thank Chair Margaret Chin for filling in on short notice for this hearing for Councilmember Rose, who can't be here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Speaker Corey Johnson. Good morning to each and every one of you. I thank you all for joining us today for a very important hearing. I also want to join our speaker in thanking Chair Margaret Chen for sitting in for Chair Debbie Rose and certainly want to continue to keep her and her family in our thoughts and prayers. And I'm grateful to be here with all of you and all of my colleagues. And I want to say thank you very much to our commissioner of DYCD and his team at DYCD. I am very proud to have one of the pre-considered intros on today's agenda that relates to runaway and homeless youth. Uh, many of you may know that I'm serving in my second term of the city council, but certainly no stranger to the pressing needs of many of our vulnerable youth. Um, I served as a member of the New York State Assembly and a member of the Children and Families Committee that was led by the late great assembly member Barbara Clark. And this was one of our issues that we always champion every single year, every single budget to make sure uh, that the state legislature provided its support in making sure that runaway and homeless youth have opportunities for growth. Um, we know that our runaway and homeless youth need our protection. Uh, many of them are alone, abandoned, and often fleeing a very un uh, unhealthy and abusive situation at home. Um, these students, these kids deserve every opportunity to get on their feet and lead healthy and productive lives. Thanks to a recent state ruling, the city of New York now has an opportunity and the ability to extend the amount of time that these young people can safely stay in our shelters. And it's imperative that we allow them to do so. Under this legislation that's proposed, the young people would be able to stay in a shelter up to 60 days or up to 120 days with written permission from a guardian or beyond that time limit if the Office of Children and Family Services is properly notified in writing. Young people in transitional independent living programs would be able to stay in these programs for 24 months or beyond that time limit if the Office of Children and Family Services is properly notified in writing. By extending the shelter time limits, we are giving many young people much needed opportunity at stability and providing them a chance to make good, healthy choices that will keep them on a pathway to success. This is a common sense and reasonable measure that protects many of our vulnerable young people. And I'm very proud to join Speaker Johnson and certainly uh, Councilmember Torres, who is the other sponsor of the other legislation in making sure that today's conversation is happening. And certainly I want to join Speaker Johnson in commending all of the young people and youth advocates and service providers who are here. Your voices are very critical to this overall conversation. I'm grateful that we're starting the new year focusing on a topic that is very, very important. Our children deserve to lead healthy, productive lives to not be a statistic, but be a success story. And it is our fundamental responsibility to remove every barrier to their success. And I applaud all of you for the work that you're doing. You are changing lives, you are saving lives, and you are giving our young people the first chance that they always deserved. Not a second chance, but a first chance that they deserve at having a successful future. So I thank you, I look forward to today's hearing, and once again, wanna thank Speaker Johnson for his leadership, and recognize our Chair Margaret Chen for her leadership as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Gibson. Um, we're gonna invite out the first panel, uh, Commissioner Bill Chong, uh, Deputy Commissioner Susan Haskell, and then uh, Assistant Commissioner Randy Scott, and our council will sway you in. In accordance with the rules of the council, I will administer the affirmation to the witnesses from the mayoral administration. Please raise your right hands. 
Uh, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee? I and do. And to respond honestly to council members' questions? Uh, yes. Thank you. Right. Uh, good morning, Speaker Johnson and members of the Committee on Youth Services. I am Bill Chong, the Commissioner of the Department of Youth and Community Development. I'm joined by Susan Haskell, Deputy Commissioner of Youth Services, and Randy Scott, Assistant Commissioner for Vulnerable and Special Needs Youth. With the start of the new term, we look forward to working with you to build on the progress we have made under Mayor de Blasio's leadership in serving young people and the communities across the city. Thank you for the chance to testify today on the three pre-considered bills that focus on runaway and homeless youth. We appreciate the City Council's long-standing interest and support of DYCD's runaway and homeless youth programs. For the benefit of the new committee members, I will start my testimony today with a brief overview of our programs. DYCD's runaway and homeless youth programs are, are designed to serve youth holistically, enabling them to obtain the services needed to place themselves on the path to independent living and stability. We are committed to helping young, people, young New Yorkers build new skills and flourish. DYCD funds an integrated portfolio of runaway and homeless youth services that are delivered by community-based providers through co <coughs> excuse me, contracts. There are three types of services. Uh, the, the, the three types of services include residential services, drop-in centers, and street outreach. Residential services are comprised of crisis shelters programs, previously called crisis shelters, uh, and transitional independent living programs currently serving young uh, youth ages 16 to 20. The New York State Office of Children and Family Services regulates all residential services provided by youth bureaus across New York State. DYCD is the designated youth bureau for New York City. Crisis shelter service programs provide emergency shelter and crisis intervention services. Youth can have their basic needs met while developing a service plan with short-term and long-term goals. In cases where family unification is po not possible, provider staff work with youth to identify appropriate transitional and long-term housing placements. Transitional independent living programs are a longer-term housing option that provides support as youth establish an independent life through educational and career development services health services and mental health services, counseling and basic life training. Drop-in centers serve young people through, the, through ages 24 or in each borough. At seven drop-in centers, youth are provided with basic, service, basic needs such as food and clothing and supportive services such as recreational activities, health and educational workshops, counseling, and referrals to additional services including shelter as needed. Street outreach focuses on locations in the city where you, runaway and homeless youth tend to co congregate, offering on-the-spot information and referrals. The goal is to develop a rapport with the youth and connect them to services, including shelter. When I testified on September 28th, I highlighted some of the major achievements of this administration, which has made unprecedented investments of over $20 million to keep young people safe and, and sheltered. By 2019, we will have tripled the number of beds available to runaway and homeless youth in this city. We remain deeply committed to supporting runaway and homeless youth and appreciate the ongoing conversations with the council about how to best support this population. Since my last testimony, we have even more good news to report. There are now 545 beds open and available to young people. S since September, a new 20-bed crisis service program opened in Harlem. An additional 20, uh, 20, 206 beds are contracted and have been awarded for a total of 751. We anticipate another 100 of those beds to be certified and certified open by June 30th, and we are on target to have all 753 beds open in FY 2019. Through Fir uh, First Lady Shirley McRae's leadership on the New York City Unity Project, DYCD expanded its reach across all seven drop-in centers to serve 2,400 more youth. The Unity Project is the city's first ever multi-agency strategy to deliver services to address the unique challenges and unmet needs of LGBTQ youth. A high portion of the overall runaway and homeless youth population identifies themselves as LGBTQ. New resources from the Unity Project also, also funded the second drop-in uh, drop center to operate 24 hours, seven days a week, located in Queens and operated by Sheltering Arms. That builds on Alley 40's 24-7 drop-in center in Harlem. 
We are pleased that through expanded hours, more young people can access services at any time when they need it. The First Lady and I visited the Queen's Drop-In Center last month. It was a wonderful visit, and we appreciated hearing from young people about their experiences and needs. With the support of Thrive NYC, runaway and homeless youth continue to access high-quality mental health services. In the current fiscal year, nearly 1,400 youth have accessed mental health services. Since the launch of Thrive NYC's support, nearly 6,000 youth have benefited from this investment. In partnership with the Department of Homeless Services, we have launched a direct referral process to allow youth from DYCD-funded residential programs to more easily transition to the adult shelter system. The expedited intake and assessment process saves youth time and energy and streamlines the administrative process of moving to an adult bed. This practice was codified in December by the passage of a bill sponsored by Speaker Johnson and Council Member Salamanca. Finally, DYCD is supporting the applications of runaway and homeless youth for supportive housing, including one of the first New York City 1515 supportive housing programs operated by the Jericho Project. I will now address the three pre-considered bills on today's hearing agenda. We greatly appreciate the productive conversations we've had recently on these bills, and we welcome the opportunity to meet with the council sponsors after today's hearing to further discuss the bills and other ways to, to partner to better provide services to this population. As I stated at the September hearing, while the state law amendments to the Runaway and Homeless Youth Act authorize municipalities, youth bureaus, the option to expand services for 21 to 24 year olds, the state has not provided funding to support the program expansion. I want to emphasize that while we wholeheartedly support the intent of these bills, the administration cannot implement these measures before identifying adequate funding resources. I also want to uh, restate a fundamental concern about the Council's proposal that we have shared at the last hearing. Under state law, DYCD and other youth bureaus throughout the state have been given the authority to create a comprehensive plan for providing services for runaway and homeless youth. This discretion from the state is limited, in, uh, is limited in that we must obtain state OCFS approval for our plan and service providers must comply with OCFS regulations. The state law gives DYCD more discretion than these bills would allow and thus we remain concerned they do not align with the state legis legislative and regulatory framework that entrusts responsibility for these programs with localities, youth bureaus. I will now offer comments on each of the pre-considered bills on today's agenda. Pre-considered 39, formerly intro 1706, sponsored by, sponsored by Councilman Torres, relates to the runaway and homeless youth services for homeless young adults. We acknowledge that homeless youth, young adults are a vulnerable population in need of the highest quality services available, DYCD is working in partnership with DHS and HRA to improve services for homeless young adults, including the more streamlined process to access adult shelter programs and that I mentioned earlier in my testimony. The city is also increasing the number of supportive housing units for young adults. In order to expand runaway and homeless youth residential programs to homeless young adults, there are various factors to consider. First, provider capacity. Expanding residential programs to serve homeless young adults would be a substantial new effort for existing runaway and homeless youth providers. DYCD would need to identify which current providers and or new providers could potentially serve homeless young adults. Such providers would need to be assessed not only for their willingness to expand programs, but also their expertise and, and, and experience in, to support a new population. Critical in this process, is an assessment of whether providers would be able to find and gain site control of, of an affordable location to open a residential program site. And of course, contracts would need to be procured through the city's procurement rules. Currently, on any given day, DHS serves approximately 2,200 young people ages 21 to 24, including approximately 800 single adults and approximately 1,400 single female heads of households with children. We project that this population seeking services would likely be even larger as there are young adults not currently known to DYCD. DHS or other city agencies who would uh, be newly eligible. To even serve a portion of this eligible youth population ages 21 to 24, it is our preliminary estimate that we would need to more than double the existing number of DYCD funded shelter beds. Fiscal impact. The total costs need to be finalized due to a few reasons. For example, we have not yet fully developed a model specific to these populations, singles 21 to 24 and pregnant and parenting women. As a point of comparison, 
the cost of recent expansion of beds for 16 to 20 year olds was approximately $5 million per 100 beds, along with identifying five new and, and certifiable sites. Programmatic issues. DYCD is committed to maintaining the coordinated system we have developed over the past three years and ensure that new services would not negatively impact the progress we have made for 16 to 20 year olds. Expanding our services to young adults would therefore require we consider the appropriate mix of sites serving different age groups and what those age ranges should be. It is our position that services for 21 to 24 year, 24 year olds should be separate and in addition to current residential services. We must also consider what modifications to the program would be made for the homeless young adults. For example, additional employment or educational services, specialized medical and mental health care, and support services for pregnant and parenting young adults will be needed. Finally, we have only started to monitor the new maximum length of stay and don't know how it will impact bed availability. While this administration will triple the number of beds available by 2019, we must ensure that younger, more vulnerable youth have access to these beds. We also recommend that the effective date of pre-considered 39 be modified to January 1, 2019. For any expansion to occur, we would need time to identify providers and procure new contracts. The modified date also aligns with the FY19 2019 city budget process. Pre-considered 1288, formerly intro 1700, sponsored by Speaker Johnson, requires DYCD to develop a capacity plan to provide shelter to all runaway and homeless youth who request shelter and provide data regarding the demographics of runaway and homeless youth. Any plan that we develop would need to address various factors on how to best expand services, provider capacity, fiscal impact, and program design. The plan would also need to detail how we work with any city agency, with many city agency partners to serve runaway and homeless youth and incorporate findings from the, 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 the access to youth shelter report that the council passed in late December. We support the idea of a summary data to assess youth needs. To produce a report in compliance with this bill, DYCD would rely on providers to enter this substantive data into a new data collection system. As such, we would like the chance to review the specific categories of the required report with the City Council and providers. Together, we can finalize the categories that should be collected. Pre-considered 116, formerly 1699, sponsored by Councilman uh, Member Gibson, relates to the maximum length of stay for one and homeless youth in residential services. We agree with the goals of this bill. I advocated for this change to the Office of Children and Family Services Commissioner beginning in 2014, soon after I began as DYCD Commissioner. On January 2, 2018, DYCD issued guidance to providers indicating that the length of stay was increased to a maximum of 120 days for crisis shelters and 24 months for transition, transitional independent living programs. That said, we're concerned that the pre-considered uh, 116, uh, 116 uh, 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 offers less discretion than state law and would limit DYC's ability as New York City's Youth Bureau to implement future changes to length of stay requirements, if that should ever be in the best interest of serving youth. Moving forward, Mayor de Blasio and DYCD will continue to build on the tremendous progress we have made over the past four years to better meet the needs of runaway and homeless youth. We greatly appreciate the count City Council's support and interest in ensuring that runaway and homeless youth have quality services that meet their needs. We look forward to continuing to engage with the Council on these well-intentioned bills and to working together to improve the lives of our city's mo most vulnerable young people. Thank you again for this chance to testify and we welcome your questions. Uh, thank you. Commissioner, uh, speaker, would you start with some questions? <clears throat> thank you, Chair Chen. Thank you, Commissioner Chong. Good to see you, uh, Deputy Commissioner. It's nice to have you uh, here. So the bill that I'm sponsoring today, as you mentioned in your testimony, would require DYCD to develop a plan to provide shelter to all homeless youth, and this will involve developing an accurate estimate of the size of the RHY population, including youth who have not even touched the system or have been identified through touching the system in any way. And during this committee's September 2017 hearing, you testified that the youth count for this past year only identified 44 unsheltered homeless youth. Is that correct? Is that what? I believe so, and I think we have an updated number for the count in January, right? Is that the same number? Um, we don't have the 2018. We don't have 2018 yet, but 
Did we, did we swear? Did we swear them in? We did. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what's the new number? No, it's, it's the number we gave was the most current number. We don't. We just did the youth count for 2018. That number we don't have yet. Okay, the, but the last year it was 44. Yeah. There's a lot more than 44 homeless youth. Well, right? that. Well, it's the HUD, HUD definition. So, uh, do you want to? Well, I think the number that we feel most reliable, uh, uh, most confident is the number that Department of Homeless Service provides, which is the 2,400. These are people who have actually entered the system, are homeless, and that's the number that is, uh, for planning purposes, gives us a sense. There is an undetermined number. The number we know is the 43, 44, based on a youth count. We, you know, we, we try to improve that process every year. This uh, past year, in 2018, we added more sites because uh, uh, we want to make sure we capture the most accurate data. So um, you want to talk a little bit about what we did this year to, to do more outreach? Yeah, as the Commissioner said, we're learning more each year and we're being able to target, I think what we did, you might have something to add to this, um, target the sites where we're getting the most information in terms of, uh, in terms of homeless youth. The, the youth count that we do does provide the number, um, feed a number into the DHS count information that's provided to HUD. As I think we all agree, it's a very narrow, limited definition, but the youth count captures additional youth, and we're taking that, those young people into consideration in our analysis. So what's that number? Um, unstably housed in the, it would be another couple hundred young people. So we're up to about 250? Yeah, that sounds about right. And do we think that that is an accurate count of unstably housed uh, young people? RHY population, what do we think the number is? What do we think the most accurate number is? When we model, when we look at the folks who we are touching, who we aren't touching, when we talk to providers, what do we think that number really is? I think that's our best guess for the people. We, have, we know the young people who are accessing DYCD services now. We have a really good sense of the under 21 who are accessing shelter. We know, as Commissioner pointed out, the young people who will access DHS shelter. We know there are young people who are not in either one of those systems, and during the youth count, we connect with the people who are most connected with those young people and say, please report to us, everyone you know who's couch surfing, for example, staying with a friend unstably, and that number is a couple hundred, so that's our best um, estimate right now. I mean, so that's your best <clears throat> estimate. When you model it, you think that's the real number, or you think it's higher than that? I, I think that, yeah. I, mean, I think that's our best guess. Yeah, you know, that's based on the outreach we've done. We can always, I mean, I think we're always looking to improve the youth count. It's something that uh, we started three or four years ago. So we, sorry, I'm not trying to be difficult. No, no. Do, do you think that 244, 250 is an accurate number? It's accurate based on the outreach we've done. I'm not saying based on the outreach you've done. When you look at all the factors, and I want, I want us to understand what we really think an accurate number is, because until we have an accurate number, we cannot really figure out how to solve the problem. Well, part of the challenge, and I think I, I talked about this in September, is that when it's hard to measure a young person, to count if a young person is couch surfing and staying with friends, it's not something that uh, is easily captured. That's why we came up with the youth count to work with our, the network of nonprofit providers who work with these young people to really identify those that are not in our system, not in the DHS system, so we can get as accurate a count as possible. And so I think it's, it's our best effort to get to an accurate number, and we're always looking to improve that. Every year we add um, more sites, because with more sites we can reach more young people and hopefully get a more accurate count. But that's the best estimate we have based on the uh, the efforts of the youth count uh, last year, and we'll have um, updated numbers sometime this fall for, I guess, 2018. Do we think that there are additional steps that DYCD could be taking to make the count more accurate? We work really closely with our providers on this. Uh, we're always interested for additional ideas on how to make the youth count more accurate. Okay, so the fiscal 2018 budget included funding for uh, 753 RHY beds, I believe you testified to that. Yes. As of the September hearing that we had, 525 of those beds uh, were online. 
I saw that an additional 20 beds came online in a service that opened up in, uh, in Harlem. So that brings us up to 545. Um, of these uh, beds, how many are crisis program beds versus transitional independent living program beds? Yeah. Yeah. 309 are till beds and 236 are crisis shelter beds. And the additional 228 beds that were budgeted for, what's the status of getting those beds online? We're, we're in great shape, and I think Randy has some good news to report today. There's a lot of lag time when you fund additional beds because <clears throat> we have to do procurement, providers have to find a site, we have to get OCFS certification. We've been able to do a lot of that groundwork over the course of the past year, so now I think we're at the point where we're going to see very quickly these beds coming online, and that's why we're anticipating that we'll be on target. Do we have some additional news to report today? Well, we have, of the 545 that we announced, um, there's a possibility that 12 will be coming on within possibly this week or early next week, and then we have another 20 that would probably come on within a week after that. So we're, I'm working with um, our OCFS partners in order to get some of these um, programs on faster, but we have June 30th as our deadline to get all of those beds online. But the goal is hopefully to get them online before then. So June 30th is the deadline, is your target to get the additional 200 plus beds online. Technically we're funded for 653 this year up to June 30th and 753 the funding becomes available in 19. It was a three year plan. Yeah, so the, the, I mentioned in my testimony that we expect to get another 100 beds online by June 30th and then the, the money for the final round of 100 bed kicks in uh, July 1st. Uh, we expect to make the awards for that money before June 30th, and that gives us a good year to have providers locate sites, get them cleared, and uh, up and running by the end of fiscal, no later than the end of fiscal 2019. Uh, it takes us less time to get money out the door, quite frankly, and more time for uh, providers to find a suitable location that meets the space requirements of the state and you know, can maximize the, the funding that they can receive. So we're confident that we can, by, by June 30th, award money for 753 beds. Then we have a year to find a, about another 100 beds to bring them online during fiscal year 19. So what have some of the challenges been in actually getting the beds online? Does it have to do with uh, service provider capacity, uh, given their budgets and that they're filling a gap for the city where the city can't provide these services, so we rely on our nonprofit providers and partners to fill this gap for us? Does it have to do with our relationship with the state, uh, OCFS, and how they administer these things? What are the challenges related to timelines in us being able to ramp up when we do get budget dollars for these beds and to actually execute it so that the beds come online more quickly? Well, I think uh, I'll start and then Randy and Susan can add. I think we're always looking to grow the system because I think there's a finite number of uh, nonprofit agencies that are willing to provide these services. And so we've really reached out to wherever we could. Uh, I know we reached out and presented to the uh, AIDS Housing Coalition because we recognize these are people who have provided housing services and that funding for AIDS housing has started to dry up. So we've brought on four new providers in the last few years. Um, not everyone, every time I meet with an executive director who I think has an interest or even capacity to provide this service, I encourage them to consider applying because there's a finite number of groups now. There's only so many that will do this. I think the, the bigger challenge on space, I'll have uh, Susan or Randy talk about uh, typically getting money out the door is not the challenge. We've accelerated the uh, procurement process. It's really the location of sites. The, the sites have definitely been one of the challenges. With um, respect to New York City, the landscape that we have here is a little bit outdated in terms of what OCFS um, needs in regards to certification. So a lot of the buildings that or the apartments that the providers are looking at getting may not have a second means of egress, may not have um, 
certain number of footage for, for bed. So those are things that we have been working with OCFS in regards to understanding New York's landscape and making sure that we see what we can do with what we have to make sure that it's safe and um, you know, suitable for youth to live in. So we've been working with the Department of um, Buildings, we've been working with the FDNY in order to provide us with um, you know, approvals for us to go ahead with these particular um, sites, and that has been working. So we've been moving along, however, we still have to wait on OCFS to um, do their part of the requirement and certification and getting things done. But um, once we know that the paperwork has gone and things have been um, in place, we work with the providers to make sure that they get the sites up as um, quickly as possible, and that's one of the things that we'll be working with um, you know, one of our providers, Shelter and Arms, in terms of getting their new site up and going. So those are the things that we have to work with with landscape. So once the full implementation's in place, when we go into the next fiscal year, the extra 100 beds uh, are in the budget to get funded. We're then up to over 750 uh, DYCD beds through providers that are funded. Do you believe that there will still be an increased need for more beds going forward, or we've hit the number that's necessary? I think the thing that we haven't determined yet, and this is the extended length of stay, uh, has kicked in six weeks ago. So we don't know what impact that will have. Typically, um, to this point, before the length of stay was increased, the vacancy rate fluctuates between 8 and 12 percent, meaning that's the number of beds that might be available on any given night. Uh, now that young people will be staying longer, will, there, will that impact the vacancy rate? So the answer is we don't know. Uh, we'll have to uh, assess that in maybe at four to five months to see where we stand. Is the, is, because young people are staying 120 days in a crisis shelter, does that mean there are fewer crisis shelter beds? Does that mean we need to then uh, go back to OMB and ask for more money? That we don't know yet. I think uh, it's, it's kind of uncharted territory for us. So we're monitoring it closely because we don't want a situation where, uh, you know, we don't have enough beds. I mean, uh, Susan and I, I guess Randy, we lived through that in the last administration where we had to turn young, we were at 100 percent capacity and young people had to be turned away. So we don't want to relive that situation. So what happens when a homeless youth turns 21 living in an RHY facility? Is there an immediate separation from the services or an exit interview with counseling or referrals? What happens? Our, our providers start the um, discharge planning well before a young person's previous time limitation or their <clears throat> or their or their birthday um, and they are every young person who turns 21 will get a referral to a service it's very possible it'll be the adult shelter system um, but there will be a resource provided to every young person who's aging out how, how long how long before the 21st birthday I think that varies by by the young person, how long they've been there, how much time there's been for planning. Maybe they come in, you know, a few days before they're turning 21. Maybe they've been there for 18 months. I think it varies based on the individual. And do you track these young people as they move into the DHS system and how they move into the DHS system? Do we keep track of that? We haven't tracked that. And um, should we? Well, we're really excited about this new um, policy that we've put into place that will um, allow a young person who's turning 21 to um, take a direct referral to the adult homeless system. We just started this. We have just a handful of young people who've started to take advantage. I think it's going to take a lot of communication and coordination because we know we've heard from our providers, we've heard from young people. Um, they're not excited about going to intake um, in the adult system and even um, like a week ago, we were out at a site and I was talking to one of the like youth counselors and it was hard for her to believe what we were saying. Like, if you bring this process to the attention of DYCD and DHS, the young person doesn't have to go to intake and they don't need to go through the assessment process and repeat all their personal details and ideally they would be referred directly to a youth shelter within the DHS system. So um, we will be tracking that now more in a way that we hadn't in the past. So, um, <clears throat> I 
I really appreciate all that you all have done, and I really mean this, what I'm about to say. I mean, I was not in the council during the previous administration, but uh, Commissioner, you just referenced the fact that you and Deputy Commissioner Haskell had to live through very probably painful moments as the providers in this room had to, where there was a significant need for an increased number of beds and the money was not being provided by the previous administration. And so I am really grateful to Mayor de Blasio uh, and to his team and to you for tripling the number of beds since the first term began. So now we're up and in going into 2019, almost three times the amount of beds. That is a significant achievement. I believe you testified that the amount of money that has been put in in that time is, I think, uh, an additional $20 million in investments. Um, that is huge. Really, 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 really important. And so the mayor deserves credit. I think the council deserves credit as well for pushing you all and being a partner with you all and holding you all accountable uh, when it comes to these measures, and we'll continue to do that. So I am very grateful, and, and my line of questioning is not one to in any way diminish or not recognize those very significant achievements and the importance of that. But I also want to say that the bills that we have before us today, I appreciated your thoughtful testimony on the three bills. I appreciated that on Council Member uh, Torres's bill, you talked about uh, the fiscal impact that's needed uh, for these populations that would be covered in expanding the number of folks who uh, could then access services by DYCD. Um, uh, I don't say this in a, in a sort of a willy-nilly, um, uh, irresponsible way. I don't really care what the amount of money is. I know you have to care. And you have an agency to run, and we have, you know, some difficult fiscal times on the horizon. But when it comes to getting the requisite number of beds to homeless young people, we need to come up with the money. I, I really, if it's four million, if it's seven million, if it's eight million, we have to come up with the money. So this council will continue to push for whatever that amount of money is to expand those services. And this is not to take away, for again, from the important investments we've already made and the credit that you, your administration at DYCD and the mayor's administration deserves in this process. But whatever the amount of money is that we need to reach the population that is unreached, to ensure we continue to support the young people who get aged out of the system, I don't care what the amount of money is. We have to come up with the money. So I know there's a fiscal impact. I know we have to be careful. I know that in the mayor's preliminary budget address, he talked about $900 million in savings from city agencies. I know our city's budget is growing $2 billion this year, from $86 billion to $88 billion. So there's a lot of context at play. There are many priorities that our city has. The budget for HRA and homeless services has grown tremendously in the preliminary budget. It's not your agency, but in the preliminary budget, uh, additional funding for DHS, I believe, uh, grew $150 million. Now, it probably should because we still have a homeless crisis in New York City with 61,000 people in the adult shelter system every single night. That doesn't count DV shelters. That doesn't count DYCD shelters. So the homeless number is probably over 70,000 people who are sleeping in a shelter sometime tonight and an additional 5,000 people who are unsheltered on the streets of New York City. 75,000 people out of that number, over 25,000 of them are children under the age of 16 years old. And that probably doesn't even account the DYCD numbers of DYCD specific shelters. The most vulnerable population and that entire population of 75,000 are youth that have been rejected by their parents and their families and who are living on the streets of New York City in shelters, having to engage in survival sex because of what's going on uh, and being emotionally abused, physically abused, sexually abused, and have an enormous amount of trauma because of what's happened to them. So whatever the amount of money is that we have to come up with, to reach every single one of those young people and expanding it from 21 to 24 years old, this council is going to put that amount of money in our budget response. We will continue to lead the way in getting these young people the services and support and beds and procurement rules uh, waived and expedited that we need to do. Because, have you seen the movie Saturday Church? No. 
Do you have iTunes? No. Commissioner Chong, you're yes. killing me here. Okay, I want to ask the three of you, please, Assistant Commissioner, Deputy Commissioner, Commissioner, there is this amazing movie out that it's not, you know, I'm sure there are some inaccurate parts of the movie, uh, but there's an amazing movie out called Saturday Church. Okay. And it's about uh, a young LGBT man who is, I believe, 16 or 17 years old in New York City, shot here in New York City, who, uh, in the movie they don't say, but I believe he first identifies as gay, and then he starts to realize that he may be transgender. Mm -hmm. And he gets rejected by his family. And he accesses services from a provider at a church that has youth programming on Saturday nights. And it is a very, very moving movie that you can get on iTunes, and it's also in the theaters. And it's about the plight of young, uh, runaway, homeless, LGBT uh, folks here in New York City. I wept the whole movie. I was crying the whole movie. I was so moved by the movie and being able to tell the story of one young person and what that one young person had to face when it came to being rejected by his family and having to navigate the streets of New York City and they didn't identify the provider, uh, but you know, Ali Forney's in the room today, and I'm sure there are other amazing uh, providers in the room today. I see Beth here, who we've done amazing work with, and, and many others, that please see this movie. Please make a commitment to me that you'll see this movie, because you will be, I, I think it will really touch you all because of the work that you do on a day-to-day -day basis. The point of all of this is to say, I want you all to have the resources you need to have to reach every young person who needs to be reached. And we will advocate for that money to be included regardless of what the fiscal impact is so that vulnerable young people get the services they provide, that we, they need. We appreciate your support. I mean, I, I can bring a historical perspective to this and since you mentioned Lou Fiddler, that you know, I really truly believe that if it wasn't for Lou's advocacy during the budget cut era, uh, we wouldn't have a runaway homeless system at all. It, you know, it wasn't that long ago, four and a half years ago, where half our budget for the homeless youth programs depended on council restorations. And I remember testifying at some hearing, why is it that a lot of the uh, uh, beds were emptied in early June? And that was because many programs that relied on council funding didn't know whether the money would be there July 1st to continue those services. So we, we are light years away from that situation. I think um, money is a big part of it, but I think I want to go back to the other issue of provider capacity and, and so the known numbers we have. And looking at the DHS system, where it's 2,200 young people between the ages of 21 to 24, 1,400, more than two, almost two-thirds are young women with, with children. So. You know, part of the conversation we're having with DHS is what's the best way to serve all these young people? Uh, if a young woman is in a, a tier two family shelter at DHS, maybe it's a better place for them. Um, I visited a number of the tier two family shelters. We have uh, Sonic after school programs there. I, I visited the one that Women in Need operates in Brownsville. And, and there, uh, you know, it's a shelter. So it, you know, it, but I think given the situation, they have a lot of robust services on site. So we are only thoughtful as we develop this plan with our agency partners. What makes the most sense for a young person between the ages of 21 to 24? Because the nature of our programs, they're small. So if you look at 2,200 young people in the DH system, if, if, in the, if in the perfect world, if you wanted DYCD to serve all 2,200, that's 110 new programs we would have to add. Uh, Commissioner, I totally am with you on being thoughtful. So we welcome the money. I, I um, am totally with you on being it's thoughtful. It's not I, lack of money. It's the other challenges. I, I understand. I'm totally with you on being thoughtful. I'm with you on taking the money. Um, yes. <laughs> but I did the hope count a month ago in Penn Station. Hmm. Most of the homeless individuals who I had the opportunity to speak with that night were not young people. 
They were mostly, not exclusive, they were mostly adult men, but there were some adult women as well. And when I engaged them, as I was coached to engage them by DHS and the questions I was supposed to ask them, and we asked them if they wanted the opportunity to go to a shelter that night and take a shower and get connected to services and have a roof over their head. It wasn't a very cold night, the night of the Hope Count. They said the shelters are too dangerous. We're not going into the shelters, they're too dangerous. So if a 50-year-old man is telling me that the shelters are too dangerous, when the system requires a 21-year-old who has been severely traumatized to leave a DYCD provider facility and then be transitioned into a DHS shelter, I'm sorry, it doesn't give me much confidence that we can, of course we can be thoughtful. And I'm happy there may be certain instances where you have mothers with children, where a specialized DHS facility is a better route depending on the individual facility, the individual provider, the individual location, of course. But <clears throat> the bigger narrative here is that it would likely better when we have great providers like Jamie Palovich from the Coalition for Homeless Youth and others who do this important work, who know the specialized youth they're working with, to not have to make the heartbreaking decision to tell a 21-year-old they have to leave and go to a DHS facility because of what the law says right now. We need to fix that because the DHS facilities right now, uh, many of them are not safe, which is why homeless adults don't want to go to them. So if homeless adults don't want to go to them, homeless young people are not, want to go, are not going to want to go to them. So I hear you. Uh, when's the plan that you're talking about is going to be finished? So um, when the law took effect in January, we reached out to OCFS, and we're meeting with them uh, to, to iron out final guidance because there's a host of questions we want answered that will drive the cost. When? We, when what the meeting when will the plan be developed oh so as as soon as we have final guidance from the uh state uh we've started conversations with omb and as, as i said in my testimony we, we're we're recommending that the effective date of the leg proposed legislation be january 2019 because that aligns with the city's budget process so that you know no you know we expect to have certainty obviously in, in, in the near future i mean there's a host of questions we want to have answered by the state things mundane things but that they drive the cost like what is the square footage requirement what is the staff ratio did you what, send a letter to the state outlining we, all we, these we sent an email and we're meeting can you with share them. that email with those questions with uh, us so that we can chime in with the state as well i want to get these answers as quickly as possible we so, may get we may get an answer sooner than that um we're actually meeting with them this afternoon so um we asked for this meeting in early january and so um, we're hopeful we'll get clarity sooner, and then we can begin to in develop an informed proposal to OMB for consideration. Because what we're working off of now is what the model is for young people under 20. It may be, it probably may be more. So once we have that information, we can at least share it with OMB, and then we can have a dialogue with them, and then obviously the council can uh, certainly weigh in based on the information we have from the state. So that is where okay, we're so at. So depending when you get the information from the state, when will the plan be done? But it's tied to the budget process. So, uh, you know, obviously. So before the executive budget's uh, released? I can't, that's, I think I can speak to my end of once we have clarity and then when, whether it makes it to the executive budget or not is not a, a decision that I can make at this point. No, no, I'm not asking about that. I'm saying when will your part of the plan be done? As soon as we get an answer from OCFS. So if you get that answer today, how long will it take for you to have that plan? Not that long. It'll, you know, how long is not that long? <laughs> it depends on what the, they tell us. 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, six months? I'd rather not give you a specific date, but as soon as we have something that we uh, can share that we feel confident with, that OMB feels confident in, I'm sure we can uh, engage the council during the budget process. Okay, when is your preliminary budget hearing? Um, March 16th. So I hope you get good answers today because we will ask these questions again 
on March 16th. Okay. So I hope that you have been able to bake your plan a little bit and come forward with some more specifics on March 16th so that we can continue to ask these questions going through the preliminary budget process. Commissioner, you're fabulous. It's great to work with you. You've done a great job at DYCD. I am really grateful, not just for your tenure as commissioner, but the work you've done for years uh, as deputy commissioner and serving young people in our city. You've had a great career doing it, and I think you have been a great ally and friend to the RHY community and providers in ramping up and advocating for young people. And so uh, my uh, direct questions are in no way hostile. No. Uh, it, I have the utmost respect for you and the work that you've done, and I get great reviews, of course, from the providers who work with you and with Susan and with Randy. So I am grateful to all three of you. Uh, but we're going to continue to push, prod, cajole, and make you even more fabulous uh, so that we can continue to reach every young person who needs it. And will you three of you make commitment to see the movie Saturday Church? We will. March 16th, I'm going to ask you, did you see Saturday Church? Okay. There's voguing, there's, there's you know, it's a great movie. Well, let me just say that um, having testified more times than I can remember before Lou Fiddler, I never take it personally. Lou's a teddy bear. <laughs> okay. Thank, I'm going to turn it back over to Councilmember Chen or Councilmember uh, Brannon, uh, whoever wants to speak. And I really appreciate uh, the work we get to do together. And uh, thank you for your testimony. And we look forward to passing these bills, getting you the money you need, and implementing them to help as many young people as we can throughout the city. Thank you, Speaker, for your leadership on this. Uh, I think Councilmember Brennan has some questions. Sorry, Chair. Um, we heard from a number of uh, young people who have faced the experience of ri uh, arriving on the steps of, um, of a particular uh, shelter um, only to find that there are no beds available. Um, can you walk me through the process of what happens at that point or um, you know, what steps DYCD has taken to identify a, a bed that's available if, if a young person is looking for it? Sure, Susan or Randy can go into the protocol. Great, um, there's, there's many different steps that the provider is able to do. One of the things that we've um, allowed is for all of our providers to have access to our database system which gives them live vacancies at any given time. So they can be, review our um, system to make sure that they see what is vacant. Once they've seen um, the vacancies, then they can communicate with that particular provider, um, whether it's via email, whether it's via phone call, to find out about that availability of that bed and possibly referring a youth to that um, particular bed. If for some reason the bed is still not available, then they have the um, ability to contact myself or my team to help in um, assisting with placing that youth. Um, once we've placed the youth, then things go go normally. So those are the three steps that they have in terms of identifying a bed, um, making sure that a youth is referred for a bed, and then the placement of that youth in that bed. So those are the, um, the three options. Yeah, I just want to say over the course of the last, this is not a small achievement, over the course of the last few, couple of months, um, with respect to young people under the age of 21, we've been able to place virtually every young person in a bed. We have approximately 50 beds vacant on any given night, and we have, this is really, I think, an historic achievement based on um, the work that was just discussed, that we, we are able to place virtually every young person under 21, with some very rare exceptions. So the a situation where s uh, runaway or homeless youth is looking for a bed and there, there isn't one available, you'll say is rare. Yes. Um, I don't know if it, it's been spoken about this, the Youth Connect line. I know that in the past it was open only during business hours. Is there a plan to make that 24 hours? It, it was 24 hours, I think, 15 years ago. It was started, as you may know, by Richard Murphy, the Commissioner of Youth Services under um, 
Mayor Dinkins in the early 90s, and it was called Youth Line. And uh, this is before people, young people used the internet. So uh, there was a need back then to uh, provide that service 24-7. Uh, over the years, because of budget cuts, it's become more a referral service for um, certain uh, services like uh, somebody's use employment. Um, people are able to call 311, which is a 24-7 system, and if they need uh, access to homeless shelter, they can do that through 311 now. So rather than duplicate 311, uh, we've kind of uh, moved the design of the Youth Connect to much more of a a customer referral program, mostly for young people in the summer youth employment program, and migrated a lot of the information that used to be on the phone to the internet because that's where young people are. So, can someone get the same access from 311 that they can get from Youth Connect during yeah. business hours? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I haven't. Um, it, 311 goes directly to a line 24 7 where somebody can pick up and make a referral to the youth. Honestly, I haven't um, checked on that in a little while to confirm, but it was always going directly to um, 24 7 going directly to a shelter. At that time, it was Covenant House. So I have to double check that that's still how it's being routed. Because the, the crisis shelters are, are 24 7. So no matter when a young person calls 311, there's someone at, at Covenant House or the other shelters that can then. Uh, at help them access a bid. And I was also going to add that, you know, with the addition of two 24 hour drop in centers, um, 311 is able to direct them to those drop in centers who can assist them in terms of any referrals or placements that are needed. Um, we also have on our uh, website our drop in centers information so that youth, as well as um, you know, providers have access to numbers to contacting people. Plus, with street outreach, they have palm cards that they give out to um, individuals or youth that they come in contact with that, that provides them with the various numbers as well. And when we do presentations, we also give out um, our information, which provides them with both my information, my staff's information, as well as all of the um, contractors that we have so that they are available to have any person's name and number so that they can call them and find out if there is any availability in terms of beds and or services. I guess that just leads me to ask, what is the difference then between youth con the Youth Connect line and what's available from 311 after hours? I think Youth Connect has become a specialized service that really just doesn't do homeless youth or it, it's become more, if you look at the volume of calls we get from Youth Connect, most of them are related to the Summer Youth Employment Program, which is why we made it during business hours. I think 311 and the street outreach and the two 24-hour drop-in centers provide much more uh, content-specific uh, access to these services, whereas three one, uh, Youth Connect in its heyday 25 years ago was sort of generalist. It kind of, any kind of issue that you would have young people taking calls 24-7, uh, it's become specialized and the content-specific stuff related to homeless youth is migrated to all these other um, avenues that are more accessible. I mean, I think the 24-7 uh, drop-in centers have made a huge difference. Uh, when I visited the Jamaica drop-in center operated by Shelting Arms, I think they said they doubled the number of case, uh, case right? Is it double? Is it the number? Tripled. Tri number. Tripled the number of, of young people they saw because, you know, uh, before the, the way a drop-in center would operate, it would be 10 to 6, 11 to 7, something like that. And, you know, that's not the life of a young person. So to go to 24-7 drop-in center, made it more accessible uh, for y a lot of young people who, who show up at 8 o'clock. Just two more. So going back to, to before, if, if, if a homeless or runaway youth shows up at a shelter, they're told there are no beds available, um, is, that, is that person then given you know, an idea, go to this shelter, that one might have a bed, or like what, what's the protocol there? Well, one, it also depends on the age of the youth. Um, cause we have Did you say age? Yeah, the age. Because if the youth is 16 or 17, they get priority in that bed. So then there's a, a, a system that needs to be um, discussed in order to allow for that youth to be placed and then for another youth to be put in a, um, a next bed. But with regards to what you're asking, if a youth should um, come to a site 
Right now, there, that can't happen because there's vacancies um, within the system. So if for some reason that particular site does not have a bed where that youth has gone, the provider has the um, opportunity to call one of the other sites, whether the other crisis shelters and or TILs to make a placement in one of the beds that is vacant. If there should be some discussion around what the person not being able to be placed, then that's when DYCD comes into play, where we get into the picture where they contact us and then we make necessary um, decisions to place a particular youth. But for right now, the, the providers, the contractors are discussing between themselves of how to make a, a placement. And anytime my staff receives a call, that youth is placed within that, um, that night. And we have no youth who are not able to access any bed at this given time. I guess, I mean, do you feel that in the past, I guess my question is because there are beds available, does that just mean that we're not, you know, accessing or engaging with folks who need beds? I mean, it should be, I guess it should be a good problem to have that we don't have enough beds. I don't think that there's, it's, that we have the need, obviously. So if there are beds available, does that mean that there are more kids who are just not entering into the system? As the commissioner said, we tripled the number, or our, ultimately we will have tripled the number of beds available. So definitely more young people have been accessing those beds. That number has grown. And I think it's still to be determined what impact the length of stay will have. Um, but yeah, I do think that as, the, as we continue to communicate that there is a bed available, it's possible more young people will get out. That Instead of the message of old, like, I could try, but there might not be a bed available, that's a waste of my time. We want to communicate to young people that there are beds available. We want, if there are young people who hadn't sought services, we want them to come seek services. Okay, last question um, for me. Um, I know the last hearing I wasn't around for, but I do remember uh, DYCD saying that you are going to issue some new RFPs for service providers. Um, where Could you tell me where in the process we are with that? Uh, we issued an RFP um, at, late, at the end of last year and we've recently made awards on that. We issued another RFP early this year and those proposals have been submitted and are currently being evaluated. We anticipate making awards in the next six to eight weeks, I would say. And uh, we have an open-ended RFP because we know that, uh, you know, there's an additional, uh, you know, to give us the flexibility, if, if, if we get more money, that we can add more services. How, uh, just how many, uh, a ballpark or off the top of your head, or if you know, hopefully, how many, uh, or what the percentages or the dollar amount of services that are through RFPs, through contracts? Oh. Yeah, I mean, the one of the... Uh, the uh, things that makes DYC unique, and I always say this in budget hearings, than other city agencies, 94% of the agency's budget goes out the door. 94%. So when in the previous administration where there were cuts, it wasn't like a cut uh, of, of s staff. It was more a cut of services, either it's a summer job, it's a homeless bed, it's an after school program, because we're a very efficient agency. You know, we have a small staff of 500 people, uh, but our budget's 840 million. So I always like to say we're the small agency with a huge footprint in a lot of neighborhoods. And so we're very efficient in getting money out the door and, and become even more so in this administration. I mean, I, there's a lot of rock star providers. Um, so I, I wouldn't, and I, and I, I guess. It sounds to me like you see that as a good thing that 94% goes out the door, but to me it's a little concerning. It means it's, it goes to services. In contracts, in wages for some reason employment program. So in other words, we're not a very top heavy bureaucracy. We're very small, focused on getting money out the door to our network of, of nonprofit partners. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Um, Commissioner, do you know how many youth age 21 are aging out each year? Yeah, that. 
You know, we'll have to look at that. Some people leave service before their 21. 21st birthday. So how many are in service at age 21 and then get a referral? We can get back to you on that. Yeah, and then also how many you right. age out. I guess also include the yeah. other one that are not at uh, 21 that left. Well, the, the ones that are 21 and older and not in the, our current programs, we know the DHS number. It's 2,200, 1,400 or young women with children and the other 800 are single adults. So that's a known number. Uh, the number that age out at 21 in, you know, because a young person can show up at 16, 17. Typically the age, the largest population is 18 to 20. So if a young person uh, comes at 20 and, you know, maybe uh, is able to find an apartment and leaves before 21, uh, they haven't aged out. But then we can look at the number that actually have exited at 21. We have that data. We can just share it with you. Okay. Um, the other question is that HRA link voucher was supposed to be, uh, was supposed to be available for youth uh, in the runaway and homeless youth system by end of last year, December 2017. Has that goal been met? No. No, I don't think we set a date, but we can tell you where it's at at this point. Two, uh, two things are happening concurrently. Um, DHS, HRA has, um, revamp, is revamping the link voucher system. There used to be many different eligibility um, categories, and they're streamlining that system. As part of that streamlining, they've incorporated the needs of runaway and homeless youth for the first time into that plan. They have submitted that plan to the state, and that has to work through its process. might take a couple of months. Simultaneously, DYCD is upgrading our data system for young people, for runaway and homeless youth participants. Um, we would have to, um, in order to access the link vouchers, we have to take the information from our providers that, that would outline eligibility and share that information with HRA so that they can issue an eligibility letter. Those two things are still a work in progress and we'll outline that over the course of the next, the rest of the calendar year probably. So you don't see it up and running until next year? Maybe fall, ideally. Because that would really help uh, the young people be able to access we agree. their own home. Yeah, we so agree. is there any way to speed up that process? Well, I HRA has told us they're working with the state to get final approval. So it's not just the homeless youth piece, but this, this whole plan to consolidate all the different voucher programs into one centralized process. So that's, that, that needs to happen. And then I think we're, we're working quickly on the data piece. That's probably the easier piece that we have more control over. So that once HRA is ready to go live with this new voucher program, we can, uh, have young people, the data that they need electronically, it can be automated. And so our piece, DYC's piece, is probably within our control more than the state uh, working with HRA to finalize this new model. So, so uh, how soon are you going to be able to complete your piece in terms of um, the, data system. the data information? By the fall, yeah. yeah. Fall 2018. So. But I'm just saying that can't you speed it up? Because well, they might, you know, they might come back sooner. I mean, you got to be prepared because we want the young people to be able to get those link vouchers. Well, we're revamping our entire data system, not just homeless youth, but after school and summer jobs. So it's part of a whole data overhaul of all our systems. So that's why it's not just, if it's just one small thing, it'd be one thing, but we're launching a new data system called DYCD Connects that links all our different data systems. Because mm -hmm. in the past, we would had six different data systems. So as part of a bigger fix that we're trying to do, just like I think HRA is doing this bigger fix on rental vouchers. So it's, you know, we want to make sure it's done right for everyone. So uh, if we can do it sooner, obviously we will. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm glad you're working on it because all, now it seems like there's a lot of agency with many different no, you're absolutely right. IT system. Um, and they couldn't talk to each other. Yes. So let's, let's straighten that out. Um, the final question I have is the, uh, the drop-in center. So now you have seven drop-in center that are open 24-7. No, two are 24-7. The one um, in upper Manhattan in Harlem and the 
sheltering arms one in Jamaica, Queens. That's all we have funding for, so. So are, are there like um, statistics to show, are the 24-7 one more effective in terms of really reaching out and, and helping youth that they can drop by anytime? Well, just I can, you know, the, the example I shared about my visit a few weeks ago with the First Lady to the sheltering arms, that their caseload tripled uh, by longer hours because, you know, young people don't live a nine to five, five existence. And so by keeping it open 24-7, uh, it has allowed them to access services at a time when it fits better into their, 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 their schedules. So at least the, the sheltering arms one, uh, it immediate impact. I don't know enough about the Alley 40 one, but we can certainly give you statistics to see what impact. They've been open for three years, two years? Yeah. Three years now as a 24, so they might have, you know, their peak might have happened three years ago. Um, so they're kind of, it's a new normal for them to see more young people, but definitely in the Jamaica one within, it opened, what, two, three months ago? The, the, to say that their caseload tripled, it was truly amazing. Are there any plan to expand all, all of them to be 24-7? And what is the, I guess, the budget impact? Uh, because if you see one that was able to triple their services. There's nothing in the works yet, but certainly, you know, we're having conversations about, you know, how we can improve services to uh, vulnerable youth. And certainly, um, you know, this is always something to look at. You know, does it, is it reaching young people who um, historically haven't been able to access these services? Do you also have some data for the, the one that is operated 24-7 that are there some people that do stay overnight, like if they come in yeah. in the middle of the night, right? they, don't, they can't go to a shelter, but they are able to stay in the... Yeah. For the 24-hour um, drop-ins, they're, they're not shelters, and we don't consider them residential programs, but the 24-hour drop-ins do have the capability of housing um, a youth overnight in terms of providing them with services and then as soon as morning breaks they can make a referral to a particular crisis or a till um, to you know get that residential service but it's a, a place where they can go to not be on the street um, they do not have a, num a high numbers of youth that stay there but they are capable of um, housing or um, providing some type of shelter to well not shelter but some type of um, um, care to youth while the overnight hours are happening yeah, I, I really encourage you to, to take a look at how effective, you know, uh, the 24-7 um, drop-in centers are and really see how to expand that service and to really let uh, the young people know that this is available to them instead of staying on the street. There's a place that they can be safe and also access services. And it might be a good way of helping you identify uh, youth that are in need of uh, shelter um, that would come into a drop-in center. So I look forward to hearing more about, uh, you know, thought about how to expand that program. Do we have another question? Okay. All right, we want to thank you for being here today and really... Oh, you got one more question? I'm sorry, Margaret. All yeah. right. <laughs> well, last uh, question. Um, if if a, a homeless youth can't find a bed... And he suggested he or she goes to a 24-hour drop-in center. Um, do you guys check that off as a placement? I don't think so. No, no, I don't think so. Um, you know, because we have on any given night between 8 and 12 percent vacancies in among beds, um, the challenge is not so much there's no bed. It's making sure the young person comes in and is directed as soon as possible to the available bed. So it's rare that a young person has to stay at a, at a drop-in center, but it's a fallback position. And as Randy said, that if a young person comes in at 3 in the morning, uh, it may be safer for them to stay there. And then when um, the morning comes, they can then, uh, the drop-in center can find a shelter bed that's available. 
clarify something? I just, we, City Council passed a bill recently that's going to require us to report on young people who aren't able to access a shelter bed, and that first report will come out this summer based on the period we're in right now. We've just been issuing, like, the reporting documents for that, so showing the providers what they need to put in. And this question just came up this week. It may be why it's coming to your attention. And we have, we are, we clarified there was, are we going to count that? Aren't we going to count that? The young person's not on the street. We decided, no, we're not going to count that as a placement. But there may be some confusion because we're still just working out the communication on that and how we're going to track it. But had you been counting it before? No. Okay. But now for the reporting, reporting um, uh, bill, you will not be counting it. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here today, Commissioner, and thank you for your hard work on this. We're going to invite up the next panel. Um, we're going to invite up Lou Fiddler for the Borough President Eric Adams. Uh, Alexander Ray Perez. Travi uh, Bonilla. Arthur Sullivan. And Charles White Whitework. Lou, you want to start? Welcome. And uh, I hope that you are happy with the progress that's being made on this <laughs> runaway and homeless youth. Uh, well, yeah, mostly. Um, <laughs> I can never be happy. I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to uh, read the remarks of the borough president and then add a couple of my own personal comments after, if that's OK. I want to introduce Eugene Resnick, who's here with me. Uh, for Borough President Adams as well. He's the Deputy uh, Communications Director at Borough Hall and our LGBT uh, liaison as well. So, Thank you. Nice to meet you all. Okay. Good morning, Acting Chair Chin, Council Member Brannon, Council Staff, and the Committee on Youth Services. Let me begin by congratulating all of you for holding this hearing today on this important issue. I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify today on these three bills that can have a major impact on the lives of runaway and homeless youth in our city. While the administration has made important efforts to address homelessness, homelessness in New York City, there are still far too many young people without a place to call home due to abuse, neglect, and violence, and that is not an acceptable situation. I want to lend my strong support to all three bills on today's agenda. However, I want to emphasize Councilmember Torres' bill, Preconsidered Intro 39. In 2016, the state legislature passed the statewide Raise the Age Bill. I sponsored with Assemblymember Helene Weinstein and State Senator Diane Savino, raising the age that youth may remain in youth shelters to age 25. This change will have groundbreaking groundbreaking impact on youth access to services. But the city has yet to implement this change. In fact, earlier this year, the New York City Department of Youth and Community Development wrote providers to indicate that our great city would not be allowing our homeless youth to remain in shelters past their 21st birthday. There is no legitimate reason for failing to raise the age here in New York City. Runaway and homeless youth are often homeless due to abuse, sexual assault, 
and those who are affected are disproportionately lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer youth. The state has met this challenge by raising the age so that RHY can access assistance in a safe, age-appropriate facility. Pre-considered intro 39 will require DYCD to make this change. These are vulnerable young people in need of refuge. We cannot, with good conscience, continue to delay a continued delay protecting 21 to 24-year-olds. The fact is, with every passing day, 21-year-olds age out of our youth shelters. Nothing could be crueler than having our city wish a happy birthday to them by returning them to homelessness and street life or the adult shelter system. That is why we have been working with Speaker Corey Johnson to demand that the city immediately implement a moratorium on these discharges, allowing youth in DYCD shelters to remain in those shelters upon their 21st birthday while we resolve these discrepancies. Pre-considered intro 39 would do that, and I urge its immediate passage. I also support pre-considered intro 1288, sponsored by Speaker Johnson, which will require the proper collection and, re and reporting of data regarding our homeless youth population. Understanding the issues faced by these at-risk young people and the extent to which the issues are being properly addressed is vital to understanding how we best assist RHY. In addition, extending the permissible time of stay for youth in both emergency and transitional living programs so that young people can, can receive all necessary services is imperative. I support Council Members Gibson's pre-considered intro 1116. The effort to assist young people who have, who have been left on our streets, often driven from their homes, aged out of foster care, and left to fend for themselves, has to be a priority, not only for our government, but for our society. Proper shelter programs with proper services save lives, money, and is simply the right thing to do. I would be remiss if I did not also thank all of the youth advocates and providers, in particular the New York Coalition for Home Homeless Youth, the Campaign for Youth Shelter, Carl, Jamie, Cole, and the rest of them, all of you, for all the help and assistance they have given to my office and to the people of our city, and to the council staff as well. Uh, if Speaker Johnson thinks that I've been a, a pest, he should talk to Andrea Vasquez and Lewis Children Brown. Um, and I want to certainly acknowledge and thank uh, all of the young people who are here today uh, to testify in support of these bills. Um, on my personal note, um, I, I have to say that there are a lot of providers in this room who could speak better than I to the state of affairs today as to the, their ability to provide for 21 to 24 year olds in terms of capacity, in terms of modeling. Um, that was the first time I heard that. I mean, we have youth programs, I, I know in our city, we have youth programs that uh, deal with uh, pregnant teens and mothering teens. Uh, pretty sure that there are people in the room here who are familiar with them uh, and, and all of those things. I recognize that there are legal challenges with OCFS going forward and making sure that the state regulations conform to the city regulations. I recognize those things. I also have to point out the never-ending conflict between the chicken and the egg. You come for the money, and they tell you that the law doesn't permit you to spend it that way. You come for the law, and they tell you there's no money for it. Don't make us do this. There's no money for it. Can't give you the money for it. There's no law permitting it. We have the same situation at the state, and I'm sure advocates are going to be in Albany this budget season pressing for the state to fulfill its responsibility for the 21 to 24-year-old category as well. I am more than, I, I can't even find the, the words of delight to express at the attitude expressed by Speaker Johnson this morning. We have come so far in so many ways. Uh, it is just, uh, uh, it's joyful. 
Um, the fact of the matter is that where there's a will, there is a way. And no matter how many challenges we are facing here, let's just get this done. Thank you. Oh, I won't be delivering testimony. Hello, uh, my name is Alexander Ray Perez, and I, uh, I put together a poem to kind of uh, put together how I feel and what I'm going through right now. Um, and thank you for allowing me to speak here today. Uh, can you put the mic closer to you so yeah. we can all hear? Yeah, could you hear me better now? Okay. Um, as I'm shifting from mad to sad, I'm realizing that the idea of having and to have had puts people in a peculiar place. It allows you to put a, on this mask of class. You'll never really meet me where I'm at if you can't understand where I'm from. I've called soft spots on park lawns safe for sleeping. While you complain about the AC or heat in your house or home, I question what those things are like. I wonder about the idea of home as I schlep everything I've ever owned from subway to bus to the street and all over again for two months and a half awaiting emergency housing placement. This 24-year-old didn't know if he was going to make it. Days that I couldn't let my hunger, weakness, or mental illness get the better part of me, I'll be 25 in 85 days. Every day is a sense of panic that not even my bravest metaphor could chip at in comparison. This cannot be the example we set for youth in 2018, that profit is greater than the people that provide it. I'll tell you something the Ali Forney Center has given me that is security in a community that I would have otherwise not known existed. They are my personalized family because you can bet your behind that if I was hungry, someone had my back. In a world where my LGBT plus body has been marginalized, where many others like me fight day in, day out, um, either to be who they really are or cover it all up just for survival, I ask again, is this where we leave off in 2018? My name is Alexander Ray Perez, and after today I have 84 days until my 25th birthday. I'm not excited, I don't have plans to celebrate, to be very transparent, I'm terrified. Um, please consider raising the age, if not for my story, but maybe for those about um, 721 to 24 year olds that received service at the Ali Forney Center last year. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you very much for your poem. Um, well, it's four minutes till 12, so it's still good morning. Um, Hello everyone, uh, my name is Tarabi Bonilla, I'm 21, I'll be 22 in April, um, and I'm here today to testify on behalf of myself and others facing similar tribulations of experiencing homelessness. There are not many things that I fear in this world, however, for a long time, turning 21, an age where I should be finding myself, figuring out my career, or furthering my education was a very real fear of mine. I'm not sure if any of you have gone through this situation, but I urge you to be empathetic of what myself and my peers are fighting for. We live in a world already fueled by cruelty, hate, greed, and selfishness. Having a place to stay and access to services for young folks is quite frankly a matter of life and death. The nonprofit Institute for Children, Poverty, and Homelessness released research which relied on data of high schoolers in New York City collected by the Center for Disease Control in its 2015 Youth Risky Behavior Survey. Homeless teens are three times more likely to attempt suicide than house teens at 20% versus 6%. Um, the report found. This is critical in realizing that young folks in this pivotal time of their lives who don't have access to services will grow into young adults 21 to 25 with traumas not treated and a lack of understanding in regards to how to prosper in life. We are the future of this city and our nation. The city is always talking about its adult homeless population, but is it not logical to recognize that if we curb the amount of youth experiencing homelessness, there will be a direct impact of the on the future amount of adults experiencing homelessness. We are young folks with our entire lives ahead of us. We just need some support and assistance in our time of need. I pose this question to you all. Think back on an issue you may have faced in your youth. Could you have gotten through that time without the help of someone? I thank you for allowing me this platform and I again urge you to do the right thing. Everyone deserves a warm place to lay their head at night and a place to grow and prosper to their full potential. Thank you.
Next. Hi, my name is Charles White Wolf. I'm 24 years old. I am representing Theory of the Oppressed and AFC, along with every other organizer, organizer here. Please excuse the stuttering because I just um, I haven't slept yet. So, being that I'm 24, I am not allowed to go to certain organizations because of my age. I I don't think I've officially grown up to the point of adulthood because I am one of those faces who have experienced, who was traumatized at a very young age and was forced to grow up. To, sorry, excuse me, who has forced to grow up at a, like I said, a very young age. But it's the fact of like people don't realize if you're facing traumas and if you're facing these these things abuse, you're well. Your age kind of stops because you don't know what to do. You don't have family to teach you anything. You don't have somebody to have your back. You don't have uh, much of a support system. So when you're going to like a um, <coughs> excuse me, when you're going to um, a center or a drop-in center, you don't know what to do. And there are some people now who, well, they're coming out at a uh, old, at an older age and they need these resources. So the fact of the matter of raising the age and getting more resources for these, these youth that actually need it. I see, I've been homeless since the age of 16. And that was a very hard time for me. But when I went to Covenant House, that was actually very, that was very scary for me. Because Covenant House is not for LGBT youth. It's for youth, but it's definitely not for LGBT youth at all. It's very scary. I was terrified just to, be, to even sleep there. I shouldn't be terrified to even go and ask for resources that I actually need. So I do urge everybody here, I do urge you to do what's right. I'm not trying to give you a sob story. I'm not trying to look for empathy, but I'm trying, I want you to see what an actual face looks like. I am a human. I don't want to be dehumanized just because of my sexuality or my identity. For DHS, it feels like I'm being dehumanized. Am I not a human of my own rights? So I urge you, please raise the age. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, first, I'd like to thank council members for allowing me to speak here today. My name is Arthur Sullivan, and I have been a community organizing student with Alley Forney Center since September 2017. In my time there, I've been privileged to work with engaging, thoughtful, creative, and inspiring youth um, every single day who have been and ought to be the voice and the heart of this movement, some of who have spoken today. Um, at the end of the day, what we're asking for is simple, but it has a much larger impact than folks like me who have never experienced homelessness can truly imagine. I can't sp speak to that experience, um, but I can talk about what 21 felt like for me. At 21, I came out as transgender. Even with my family's expressed support, I struggled to accept myself and be publicly transparent with my identity. At 21, I had just finished my undergraduate degree, and all throughout my life, I had been told that my primary focus should be on my education and was supported through that. I didn't have to think about where I was gonna be housed. I didn't have to think about where I was gonna eat. I did not have to think about where I was gonna find a quiet place to study, which is often a concern of the folks that I work with. Um, so according to our 2017 data, 47% of our youth who came to AFC last year were age 21 and older. As Alexander spoke about, that's uh, approximately 700 clients trying to access 20 privately funded emergency beds for a stay of 30 to 90 days. Our waiting list for those beds is approximately six months long. It's important then that we say, when we say all these numbers, we're uh, considering that we're talking about people. A lot of our youth that come to AFC, uh, this, for, the, for them, this is the first time that they're allowed to be their full self and explore that self. Um, I want you to imagine trying to access affirming services in a community of people who will love and support you for who you are and not in spite of it. And I want you to imagine 
being told that because of your age, you are ineligible for the majority of our housing services, and you'll have to wait six months to access a temporary bed. I want you to imagine being asked to plan for a sustainable future out of homelessness when your tomorrow is profoundly unstable. It's impossible. At 21, I know I had a lot of growing to do. And at 23, I know I still have a lot to learn. We're asking for our youth to have the opportunity to l learn and grow in affirming spaces and allow them to focus their engaging, thoughtful, creative, inspiring minds on something other than where they're going to sleep after they turn 21. Thank you again for your time. Thank you very much to this panel uh, for taking the time and come and testify. We are gonna work very hard to get the legislation passed. As you've heard from our speaker, uh, the council, we are gonna fight to make sure that the money is there. Um, the council is always taking the lead to make sure that we support our homeless and runaway youth, and we will continue to do that. Um, and thank you for sharing your stories. Uh, and we hope that um, the providers can expand their capacity. So like at this, the site, the Alley 40 site that you talk about, there should not be a waiting list. And here we hear from a DYCD that there is beds available. And then on the other hand, you're telling me there's a waiting list. So something is not matching up and we really have to uh, fix that. Yeah. But thank you for being here. Thank you, Lou, for your continued support. We're gonna call up the next panel. Did you fill out paper? Have a seat and we'll, did you fill out one of the slips? Oh, okay. We also have uh, Beth Hoffmeister from Legal Aid Society with uh, Giselle Ruthier. Ruthier and Jamie Pavlovich from the Coalition for Homeless Youth. So please identify yourself before you testify. Um, council members, my name is Alexander Jacobs and I come before you today to ask that you pass this bill so people like me, 21 and older, have the chance to stay in shelters after we turn 21. I came up here to New York because I originally lived in Houston, Texas, but when Hurricane Harvey hit, I decided to come here to New York because I felt it was it would be good to build my life back up. And when I got here, I had the help of a drop-in center called New Alternatives help me. But there was no youth shelters available for some of my age. So I went to an adult shelter where I felt unsafe and scared for my life. So I did some research and everyone I tried all said the same thing, under 21 only. Um, I was upset and alone. I had no clue what I was going to do. So I called my case manager, Miss Kate, I knew alternatives, and she told me to try the Alley Forney Center. I like it, it's helpful, and I'm very grateful to have them in my life, but being 22 is making it a lot harder than if I was under 21. So please, I beg you to pass this bill so that we can help save lives of homeless youth, because it's hard having to see homeless 21 to 25 sleeping in the streets or on the sidewalk, or having to hear that someone in that age group committed suicide because new youth shelter would take them because they're too old. So I ask you to pass this bill and please help save lives of homeless youth from ages of 21 to 25. Thank you for letting me speak. Hi and good afternoon. My name is Beth Hoffmeister. I'm an attorney at the Legal Aid Society in our Homeless Rights Project. And I wanna thank you so much for stepping in on behalf of Chair Rose, um, Councilwoman Chin, to chair this hearing. I also have to, of course, thank uh, the City Council Speaker, Corey Johnson, and his staff for championing this issue for some time, as well as Council Members Gibson and Torres for sponsoring the other two bills. And I actually, the first hearing I ever testified at was uh, a hearing before Lou Fiddler on this issue many years ago, so I'm always excited to see him here. And I also wanna thank my colleagues from Legal Aid, Teresa Moser is he, still here, um, who, with whom I could not do any of this work. 
as in addition, obviously, to Giselle and Jamie, who are sitting here. So we, very it, briefly, we are supporting all three of these bills. Uh, we spoke at length about why the extended stays should be legislated uh, during the September hearing, and those reasons remain the same, and the bill language remains the same. Um, I would just mention, um, in light of what DYCD testified about today, that I think it is important that there be, I know they're in support of it, but that there is a bill that requires it, because as we all know, commissioners come and go, administrations come and go, and I think we all can agree that making sure New York City is taking advantage of the legal changes that happened at the state level, which allow for this to be possible, as, as Mr. Fiddler testified to earlier, um, we, we need to take advantage of that and, and solidify that and make a point of, of, of making that law here in the city. As for Raise the Age, I know the youth themselves have the best possible voices to speak about why that's important. Um, Carl Siciliano, who has not testified yet, and I'm sure will be testifying uh, mostly about that issue, so I don't want to kind of take the thunder away from him or from anyone else who can speak to it, but um, if there was any way that, that the Legal Aid Society brought a lawsuit in 2013 suing the city to get a right to shelter for runaway and homeless youth, that case is still being litigated in the Eastern District of New York. If there was any way we could have included youth up to the age of 24, if that was legally possible, we would have done it. Um, it was not possible. So we're very happy to see that this opportunity presents itself here uh, to be, again, to allow for the changes made at the state level that would increase the availability to these incredibly life-saving services um, to all runaway and homeless youth. So we do support that as well. Um, I would be remiss to say that with the third bill that it was, it was disappointing to see that the right to shelter language had been eliminated in this version of the bill. This is Speaker Johnson's bill. Um, we, by all means, understand the need for a capacity a plan and how important that is. And that same lawsuit we were referring to, um, you know, we believe there already is a right to shelter that exists under the law, and we're continuing to fight for that. But it would have been a very powerful statement for the city council to include that language in the legislation so that we could continue to really state to our youth who have been neglected for a period of time um, under prior administrations how important it is for them to have access to the, to the services that they need. Um, that being said, we are still in support of the bill. It is a step in the right direction. We would just ask that the council consider putting a time frame on when that bill would be implemented, that, or the capacity plan that's mentioned in the bill would be implemented so that a next step can be taken going forward to ensure that you have a place to stay. Um, I want to just finish off by saying um, one of my colleagues who cannot testify today um, always talks about and talked about earlier this morning during our rally outside that for youth, their place in, in these youth shelters feels like home. And as someone who also works with the adult home shelter, homeless, homeless shelter population, I can tell you that that's not always how it feels. And that's a real testament to the services that are being given and the support that's being given by the youth providers, um, so many of whom are here today. And I have not been a lawyer all that long, but for my past 11 years, I will say that I'm consistently um, impressed and moved and motivated by the youth and the providers that work in this system. They are constantly in the face of very difficult circumstances, thriving and making the system and their lives a better place, and frankly, all of New York City a better place. And I mostly feel very grateful that I've had the opportunity to stand alongside them and fight these fights along with them. And I'm not going anywhere, <laughs> even if this bill doesn't pass with right to shelter. We will all still be here coming back time and time again, asking and making sure that the youth have, um, have what they need to be as successful and supported as possible. Hi, uh, my name is Giselle Ruth here. I'm a policy director of the Coalition for the Homeless. I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify today. We submitted joint testimony with Legal Aid, and uh, Beth covered the majority of it uh, with, uh, with Grace. So I just want to add a few you know, small points to that. Um, one thing I want to stress is how important it is to have specialized shelter for runaway and homeless youth. And we do a lot of work within the regular DHS shelter system, but we know for sure that homeless youth have specific needs that differ from homeless adults, um, have experienced significant traumas um, that are at high risk for involvement with the criminal justice system, um, engaging in survival sex, and re uh, receiving severe mental health diagnoses, or um, uh, experiencing substance use issues. We know runaway homeless youth are disproportionately youth of color and LGBTQ, so it's so important to have those environments that um, 
that can support the population and the needs that they have. Uh, we know that research that has been done shows that use specific shelters not only meet those basic requirements but make a positive impact on a youth's ability to stabilize and successfully transition from crisis to independence. So we know that that is important and we encourage um, the city to build out the success within DYCD for youth specific shelter programs. And I, I just want to end too, and again, I think it would be remiss if we did not mention the critical need for permanent housing for homeless youth. Um, I mean, this is actually going to get at the root of the problem and ultimately reduce the need to, for shelters for homeless youth. Um, and so apart from a very small number of supportive housing units, still right now, as you, as you heard from the city, um, youth and, and the runaway and homeless youth shelter system do not have access to any city funded or federally funded rental subsidy programs. Um, so we need to make that happen as quickly as possible. Um, and we, we really hope that that can happen even sooner than the fall. Um, because if you're uh, living within the system and there's no way out, um, then it just becomes a cycle and we need to start breaking that cycle. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, and thank you for raising the point about permanent housing. I think that was the whole question with the link voucher. I mean, that is a, a mean of really helping uh, families and youth to really find the permanent housing. And then I know that in this year, um, the preliminary budget, uh, the mayor put some small amount of funding in there for this whole idea of home share. So I think that's something that I hope the providers will you know, take a look at and, and give us some suggestions and advice how we can really utilize these programs where kids, where the youth can share an apartment with another youth uh, to be able to have permanent housing. So that is something that I'm very interested in and, and hopefully the providers can help us uh, with that issue. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Jamie Polovich, and I'm the executive director of the Coalition for Homeless Youth, also known as the Empire State Coalition for Youth and Family Services. I represent 60 runaway and homeless youth agencies across New York State. 29 of them are here in New York City. Um, I would like to thank you, Councilwoman Chin, for stepping in and chairing today's very important hearing. And I also would like to put on the record that the coalition does congratulate um, new chair Rose to being appointed to the Youth Services Committee. And we're really looking forward to her leadership and working more closely with her. Um, I would like to say that I've been in this role for about 18 months. Uh, and one of the things coming into this role was, I think, somewhere deep down inside that politics was still kind of about doing the right thing. Coming Now being in this role, you learn very fast that that's not always true. And I think that I can't say how appreciative I am that the council is definitely showing in regards to runaway and homeless youth how to do the right thing. Initially last session with the full five bill package that was introduced, it was a huge step forward in making sure that young people had the their needs were being met and that they had the protections that they need to really strive in the runaway and homeless youth system. And I think that a lot of that has been with the leadership of now Speaker Johnson and kind of being a true champion to all of the young people in this room and the young people that aren't in the room and their needs. I just wanted to share a little story um, and I am thankful that young people did get to testify before at least myself because their voices are definitely the most important in this matter and it's really unfortunate that the administration did leave before hearing what the young people had to say. Okay. Thank you for staying. Um, after the last hearing in September, I have the extreme pleasure of working with 10 amazing youth advocates that helped me with a lot of the work that the coalition is doing. And we had a meeting a few days after the last hearing, and it was really hard to kind of debrief with young people about things that they hear at these hearings, right? Things that they know in their own lived experiences aren't true, and to come into these rooms and hear city officials testify otherwise. It's, re it's really disheartening, and it's really concerning for them, and as an advocate and someone that came from the provider world, right, to have to sit in a room with them and explain to them how people come into a room and testify regarding issues that they themselves are not living to know are true. Um, and so I just kind of wanted to put that out there. Regarding the three bills that are being considered today, the Coalition for Homeless Youth is in full support of all three bills, but I would like to echo what Beth mentioned 
around um, the bill that was previously the right to shelter bill um, and a little concerned that the language has sh shifted on that to make it more of a planning bill. Um, we do agree that there is a need to come up with a comprehensive plan, how to move forward to make sure that all young people can access the right to shelter. We believe that it is a responsible step, but we do hope that a time frame is implemented in regards to that to make sure that the city does move forward quickly with actually granting young people the right to shelter in youth appropriate settings. Regarding um, the bill to extend the age, I mean, I think I definitely can't say it as well as all the young people said it before, but this needs to happen. Um, young people 21 to 25 are more supported, they feel safer, and they are gonna see better success if they're allowed to stay in small home-like environments. There's a reason why the New York State regulations requires that certified runaway and homeless youth programs are under 20 beds. And you know, understanding that there are programs that are bigger than that that have approval to do so, but for the most part, programs are under 20 beds because they recognize that young people do what better in small home-like environments. Um, I shared a story outside that in my previous life working in foster care, it was not abnormal when a young person turned 21 at the program that I worked at to discharge them literally across the street into the adult homeless shelter. Since that time, ACS has changed their policies and that can no longer happen. But then for a decade after that, I ran a DYCD funded till and we, time and time again, discharged young people on their 21st birthday into the adult shelter system, knowing that it was not in their best interest, knowing that they were not ready, and with the population that I worked with, knowing that more times than not, it probably meant that they were going back into the commercial sex industry than actually the DHS shelter system. And it's really disheartening to me that more than a decade later, later DYCD hasn't changed, right? They are still discharging young people on their 21st birthday, and this bill would really kind of force their hand to kind of do the right thing, not kind of, but do the right thing and let young people stay until their 25th birthday. In regards to the bill regarding the extended length of stay, what Beth, to echo what Beth said as well, we support that, and we do understand that this is something that DYCD is already in the process of implementing, but agree that it is really important that it gets put into law to make sure that it is something that young people have access to in future administrations and not something that can just be changed kind of depending on people's mood um, that year. So thank you again for the opportunity to testify today. Oh, I'm sorry, I have one more thing to add. Um, Speaker Johnson asked a few different times what the actual number from the 2017 youth count was. From the actual youth count, the number that was gathered was 44, but combined with um, the number that was gathered during the actual point in time count, the total number is 265 unsheltered young people um, in 2017. Thank you very much, and thank you for taking the time to come to testify today. We're going to call up the next panel. Uh, Carl Siciliano from the Alley Forney Center. John uh, Senegal for Covenant House. And uh, Sarah, Meeker. Oh, Sarah Meeker from The Door. Uh, Michael Pollenberg and Lorraine Losada from Safe Horizon. Oh, I guess Larissa, Larissa Losada. 
Can you please uh, you can begin? Is that okay? I'm Carl Siciliano. I'm the founder and the executive director of the Ali Fernay Center. Uh, as Corey mentioned, I've been working with homeless youth in New York City for uh, 24 years. Um, the Ali Fernay Center is very strongly in support of all three bills, but I'm going to restrict my comments to the issue of, of raising the age. And I'm going to start by telling a personal story that I think helps me understand the wrongfulness of the city's position on this up till now. Um, when I was a child, I was a, a stepchild. Uh, my, my, my parents were divorced, and, and my father remarried, and my brother and I were the stepchildren. And we would sleep in the basement, uh, in an unfinished room with no windows. And the other children got to sleep, you know, upstairs in the nice part of the house. And um, since 2010, DYCD has had 21 to 24-year-olds in their care. Um, the drop-in center is extended their age at that point so that young people could stay through until the, their 25th birthday. And um, the street outreach changed. But for years, um, you know, they have not been willing to provide housing to, to, to 21 to 24 year olds. So what I get to see is, is young people who are sort of treated like, this, like stepchildren by the city, like the unwanted, unloved stepchildren. Um, I'm thrilled that the administration has added so many beds. But what it's done, it, while on the one hand it's made things so much better for the young youth, uh, for the older young people, you know, they get to see the younger ones treated well. And, and they sit in the drop-in centers waiting for months and months and months. Um, but I don't really want to focus on, on my personal story as much as on what the personal stories of the young people who, who sleep in the streets have told me. Um, what does it mean that young people age out when they're 21 and are terrified to, to go to the adult shelters? For a lot of them, it means they sleep on the subways. And, but sleeping is a misnomer because they're, it's almost impossible to sleep on the subways. They, 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 they tell me how they sleep in five or ten minute bursts. They say how you know, scary it is, how uncomfortable it is, how they're afraid of the police, how they're afraid of being assaulted. Um, you know, so it's more like they're just chronically exhausted. Um, I've had young people talk to me about sleeping on roofs. Like they'll find a building where they can access the roof and they sleep on the roof and they pray that it doesn't rain or snow that night. Um, I've listened to young people talk about sleeping in abandoned buildings. I, I remember one young man told me about how a, a few of his friends and, and he were sleeping in an abandoned building that had been destroyed by Hurricane Sandy in Staten Island and how the floor snapped and broke one of their legs and how they, they carried the young person for blocks because they didn't want the police to realize where they were staying. Um, I've listened to young people talk about uh, how they have to do survival sex. I remember one young man telling me about uh, how the first time he ended up doing it because he just couldn't face another night sleeping on the subways how he went to a friend's house that morning and wouldn't come out of the shower for an hour because he was crying and he didn't want people to see him crying because he felt so humiliated and ashamed by what he had been through. For years, we have been watching these young people suffer. We have been listening to their tears. We have been responding to their suicide attempts. Enough. The state has finally passed the law we need the council to, somebody's got to do the right thing here. Somebody's got to be the responsible adult. Somebody's got to stop treating these young people like stepchildren. And I beg and I implore the council to do it. I implore you to put the money in so that beds can be made immediately available. Um, I want to make clear, uh, which I've made clear to OCFS and to DYCD, that we have 34 beds that we can immediately make available to 21 to 24-year-olds, and we're happy to negotiate to make other of our beds 
uh, you know, available if, if, if they're willing to do that. It, to us, it's an emergency. It should be an emergency that, that no young person should have to be forced to sleep out on the streets because of, you know, they hit their 21st birthday. So, you know, I thank you for your leadership. I thank the council. I thank the speaker. And I just beg you to do it and to make it happen fast. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is John Santagar, and I am the communications director at Covenant House New York. Um, I'm going to be echoing a lot of what everyone else here has said today. Um, I want to thank you for the opportunity to give testimony. Um, Covenant House New York is the nation's largest nonprofit agency serving homeless, runaway, and trafficked youth. Uh, we strongly support these important bills, which address longstanding barriers that prevent youth from fully accessing the help they desperately need. We want to recognize and applaud DYCD's pledge to extend the contracted length of stay in shelter to 60 days with a possible 60-day extension. Uh, we're concerned, however, that without a current law in place in New York City, future administrations could potentially roll this progress back and reinstate a 30-day limit. Uh, 30 days with a 30-day extension is insufficient, simply insufficient to fully address the needs of a young person in crisis. Uh, it's difficult to focus on healing from trauma, finding a job, or addressing mental health issues when the primary focus becomes where he or she is going to live after just 30 days of being in our shelter. Uh, the result is that RHY shelters are forced to discharge youth before they're ready to leave. When no other youth shelter beds are available, youth are plunged back into homelessness and they couch surf, live on the streets, or engage in survival sex. Some become victims of human trafficking. Uh, mandating the length of stay to a possible 120 days uh, through New York City law would greatly help stabilize our young people. Um, we also really support extending the age of RHY programs to include youth up to age 25. Um, it's heartbreaking when Covenant House is forced to discharge a young person on their 21st birthday or tell young people over age 21 we can't help them. Science has taught us that a young person's brain continues to develop until they are 25 years old and that young adults have different needs from older adults. 21 to 25 year olds often fear entering the DHS shelter system, so the result is that they couch surf when they can. otherwise turn to the streets or survival sex, as we've heard today. Uh, we support allowing homeless young adults to remain in RHY shelters until their 25th birthday. Um, however, we also really would like to emphasize the need for additional funding in order to adequately serve um, all of these youth. Uh, the passage of these bills would provide incredible support to our young people. We appreciate that advocates, city council, and DYCD all agree that every young person in need deserves a bed. However, it's imperative that sufficient funding is available to ensure every youth seeking help can be served in a youth setting. Uh, I'd like to thank Council Member Gibson and Council Member Torres today for holding today's hearing, um, and a special thank you to Speaker Johnson for the introduction of these bills and for being a champion for our youth. Uh, I also want to thank the entire New York City Council for their support in the fight against youth homelessness. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Um, my name is Michael Pollenberg. I'm Vice President of Government Affairs for Safe Horizon. I'm joined by my colleague, Larissa Lozada, who's the Assistant Director of Outreach for Safe Horizon Street Work Project. Our Street Work Project is a program for homeless youth. We have two drop-in centers, uh, both in Manhattan. We have an overnight street outreach component, which Larissa oversees, and we have an overnight uh, shelter, uh, uh, 24, 24 beds um, up, in, up in Harlem. Um, and you can say, I'm not going to, obviously going to read this testimony, you can see you know, what is the impact of, of our work in terms of a number of outreach contacts, number of clients we see at our drop-in centers and so forth. It's all in the testimony. Um, so quickly, I, you know, we obviously support these bills, echo the concerns raised by Beth and others about the right to shelter bill. Um, Larissa will talk more about the experience of, of young people and, and, and the reasons they don't go to DHS shelters by and large. Uh, but I also just wanted to you know, put this in the context that while we look at this homeless youth issue, the City Hall and others are looking at anti-trafficking efforts. What can we do to address trafficking? We have this issue of trafficking. Should we come about it from this angle? Should we go about it from this angle? Um, what are all the factors we need to consider? Um, and here's a humble suggestion, make shelter available for kids, for older kids. I mean, it is such a critical piece to help address um, the reality that young people otherwise feel they have no other choice. Carl referenced it just a short time ago. 
Um, it's such a simple piece, and, and, and for the city and for the state and others who are looking at how to address trafficking issues, it seems like this, is, this isn't the only way to, uh, the only thing that needs to be done, but it's a critical piece. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Larissa and can talk a little bit more about, um, uh, about the bills and, and why we would support them. Uh, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Larissa Lozada. I'm assistant director of, uh, at Streetwork, and I oversee our outreach program. I've been with Streetwork for 11 years and in my current role for two. Um, at Streetwork, we utilize a harm reduction philosophy we've adopted, and we work with uh, clients, our clients through a trauma-informed lens, and we focus on being client-centered. So one of the main uh, components within this work and our approach to the work is the element of time. Um, these things, being able to meet a young person where they are and work with them through their traumas and being sensitive to the traumas that they've endured, understanding that it impacts um, their development and the pace in which they move. So time is something that uh, we need and see rarely of, particularly for those clients who are tw turning 21. Uh, in my time at Streetwork, I've been a uh, in a couple of different capacities. I have experience in our residential program as well as outreach. And during my time at our residential program, um, one of the things um, that most stood out and was prominent to me was that our residential programs, should it make sense for them to reflect the age of the drop-in center and the young people that we serve in our drop-in center. It's conducive to fostering a nurturing and seamless um, service of care. Another thing at the, at the residential sh uh, shelter system is that 30 days is just way too short of a period of time. Understanding that many young people come to us feeling unsafe, feeling vulnerable, and having internal barriers set up for themselves as survival mechanisms. It may take some time before a case manager or counselor can even begin to chip away with a young person um, some of the barriers that may be in place that um, hinder them from being able to obtain stable housing. So. It may take two weeks for a young person to feel safe enough to share information uh, that a case manager may need in seeking uh, appropriate housing and the next steps after their residential stay. And then 30 days is here and it's up and it's gone. It's, uh, it's, too, it's an unrealistic uh, time frame. Out on outreach, uh, in our testimony, you'll see the outreach unit. Last year, we made approximately over 1,400 street engagements, uh, 14,000, I'm sorry, street engagements and contacts uh, with young people who are unstably housed or street homeless last year. Of those 14,000, I can testify that a very small handful of young people who were appropriate to be placed in DHL, uh, DHS shelter system, meaning they were 18 or above, opted to do so. When we engage them, their primary um, thoughts and feelings are that they are unsafe in the DHS in the DHS uh, system, that they don't have the tools necessary to navigate the adult shelter system, and that there are not support systems in place that are youth specific at the DHS sh shelter systems. So a young person in January or February in uh, cold blue weather may very well opt to stay street homeless for that night, um, as opposed to navigating the adult system. And these are just some of the experiences that um, I've come across in my 11 years with street work and some of the things that the young people that I work closely with have shared with me. So again, um, I am in support, this program is in support and the agency is in support of these three bills and I would hope uh, that they would be come into fruition soon. Thank you for your time. Oh, I apologize, I forgot to add really quickly, just one thing. Uh, I, I want to say how much, how much strongly in support we are of uh, what uh, Lou Fidler and Borough President Eric Adams have recommended, that there be an immediate moratorium on young people aging out on their 21st birthday. I, I just ask that the, the council reach out to, to the city and to the state and say that there should be like a, a, a 
an ending on, on youth aging out while we work out this, these new policies. Uh, thank you, Carl. I, the question I have for you uh, and providers is that from the, um, the commissioner's testimony, he raised the issue about capacity. Uh, so I guess, like, are the providers ready? Uh, do you think that you have the capacity to provide shelters for youth who are 21 to, to 24, 25? Speaking for the Ali Fernay Center, which is the only thing I can do, um, we have a new 14-bed contract with DYCD uh, that we're waiting for the state to certify the sites. We've made it very clear to them that we want those beds to be for 21 to 24-year-olds. Uh, in addition, the, the, the young person who, who, who testified earlier who, with the Ali Frenet Center referenced that we have a privately funded shelter. You know, four years ago, we lost the funding for our only shelter that was for 21 to 24-year-olds. It was funded through HAPWA, and, and they changed their requirements that it had to just be for people with, with HIV or AIDS. And, and you know. So we, we have been, you know, cobbling together funding to keep those 20 beds operating. We would love for those to be able to be funded by DYCD. So, you know, those two bed, you know, those two different programs combined could immediately be housing 34 young people through DYCD. Are, are there, is it very difficult to identify sites that might be suitable uh, for? Landlords are not dropping all over themselves to rent to, to homeless youth providers. Often when we have a new contract, it takes us many, many months before we find a landlord who's, who's willing to rent to us. However, we've been doing this so long and we've got good relationships with a number of, of, of new landlords. If the city were to make you know, funding available for 21 to 24 year olds, we would definitely go after more beds and, and seek to, to, to... Right now, we have about 180 young people on the waiting list for our beds. 140 of those are 21 to 24, uh, about 30, 37 or 33, I think, are, are, are um, 16 to 20. And really, the reason that they're on a waiting list, even though there's capacity, yeah. is because they prefer to be in an LGBT specialized shelter, which is what we, we provide. Oh, okay. So that's why the, the, the data doesn't match when. Right. But, when but the 21 to 24 year olds just have really nowhere to go. I think that's, that's helpful to know and also. It would be helpful to like, have provider to be able to kind of start identifying more available site. You know, don't wait until um, the funding comes through, but if there are possible, you know, good-hearted people who might be able to help, uh, let's try to identify the site so when the funding is available, you can uh, get started and up and running quickly. I can promise you, if the funding is available, we will do everything we can to, to provide those beds. It's terrible for us to have so many young people with nowhere to go. Great. And I would just add that it would help um, not only for funding available in terms of a bed rate, but also for any capital work that needs to convert an existing building into something that meets OCFS's standards and that is, you know, the right configuration for young people. So whatever proposal the city has put out or is thinking about putting out, um, I echo Carl, I think most providers would jump at the chance, um, but real estate, given what it is in New York, you need to have a rate that's reasonable and you need to have capital funding or startup funding to be able to convert a building into something that OCFS will approve of. Good, that's, that's very good uh, suggestions that we should include capital funding to make sure that um, the site could be suitable. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to testify today and for all the great work that you do for our youth. Okay, so this is our last panel, but if anyone else that want to testify that haven't signed up, you can still sign up. Um, Kate Barnhart from New Alternatives, uh, Craig Hughes, Ramon Le LeClerc okay. from New Alternatives, and uh, I think she uh, provided the testimony on the record, yeah. Please begin. Okay. 
Okay. I'm the director of New Alternatives for LGBT Homeless Youth, and we serve young people up to age 24. And we also have an aftercare program for folks who need ongoing services after age 24, but I know we're not even going to touch that problem yet. Um, there were, I'm not going to repeat a lot of the stuff because, you know, many people have already made a lot of crucial points, but there are a couple of things that I'd like to share based on my, I don't know, many years of experience. Um, I was the director of Sylvia's Place, which is an emergency shelter for LGBT homeless youth previously. So one of, and they go up to 24 as well, but they do it all with private dollars, as does New Alternatives do everything with private dollars. Um, one of the things that I have, you know, noticed over my years of working with young people is that the length of time it takes to accomplish many things with young people has been getting longer and longer. For instance, if you're applying for SSI with a client um, and it gets denied and you have to wait for a hearing, the length of wait for a hearing in New York is now a year and a half to two years. So the idea that you're going to accomplish many things with a young person before their 21st birthday is very unrealistic. And so, you know, we go up to age 24, which allows us the time to engage in some of these long-term processes. Applying for mental health housing, very long process. Or um, I have one young woman who uh, applied for housing when her son was born and just got her apartment. He's, he was seven when she got her apartment. So, you know, it's really important to keep in mind that um, this work is a long-term effort of healing trauma and navigating all these bureaucracies. Um, the other thing I'd like to point out is that link vouchers have been of limited useful, usefulness to our clients. Um, there's a huge issue with landlords um, refusing to take them, and young people who have never had an apartment and have no rental history, no credit history, are in a really poor position to, to navigate leases in the private market. Um, so if link vouchers are going to be available to young people, there needs to be also some sort of support system to help them navigate that process because I've had young people taken advantage of by unscrupulous landlords during that process. I've had all kinds of um, negative outcomes. And then regarding the DHS system, many of my clients have wound up in the DHS system at one point or another um, because we work with folks who are over 21. We got a lot of them because they can't go most other places. And in the DHS system, I have my, especially LGBT clients are very vulnerable. And I've had clients suffer assaults, sexual assaults, um, have you know, their belongings stolen repeatedly. It's really not an appropriate place, I would say, for most people, but in particular for vulnerable young people. And finally, I think that this age, the young adult period, it's vital to intervene. It's almost our last chance to intervene to prevent people from becoming chronically homeless. The longer people are homeless, the more demoralized they become. And at a certain point, it's almost like people just are overwhelmed and exhausted and they just, you know, they just start to slip into this chronic homelessness. And finally, this is really a matter of life and death. I would say I lose about one client a year. Um, you know, I still have clients who die of AIDS. I have a girl in the ICU at Jacoby right now who probably won't survive. Really, housing makes the difference between life and death, and I can't put it any more clearly than that. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Ramon Leclerc. Um, ten years ago, I became homeless while aging out of foster care. I have very mild cerebral palsy, and I was scared, pardon my French, but shitless of going to DHS because of things that I've heard. You know, um, so I ended up going to street work. Uh, I, and they, were, they had a privately funded overnight shelter which allowed people up to 24 to stay uh, 90 days at the time. I met Craig there. Um, after my 90 days were up, my case manager in the drop-in referred me to Kate as somebody who identifies as a cisgender heterosexual male. Um, 
I re he referred me to Steve Sylvia's, my case manager referred me to Sylvia's place because of my fears of being bullied and antagonized and whatever else the case may be at the time. Um, Kate, I spoke to Kate, my case worker Jay spoke to Kate, and um, Kate said to me, well, if you're okay, I'm cool with it, but if you're okay with me putting your bisexual on your paperwork, I said, sure, why not? Um, I've been working with Kate as a volunteer for since 2011. Um, and yeah, this is just, it, it's, it's hard. I mean, yeah, um, well, I was, after I, my 24th birthday, I actually started attending school and on numerous occasions, well, in DHS, my books were stolen. I was afraid to go to class because I still had the high school that I had had the high school mentality when I first started at BMCC. So, um, you know, I thought the professors wouldn't care. You know, oh, you're in a shelter, your books got stolen. Oh well, find a way. You know, that's what I thought. But and I dropped, and then I went back, and then I figured that I found I realized that it wasn't that way that they were actually more compassionate. But um, yeah, so. It was a real obstacle for me to have to navigate the DHS system, and um, you know, be a student and maintaining a part-time job at the time too. Um, so yeah, I mean, I was hardly ever there. I was always either in school or <laughs> in class or work, but um, yeah, it just became a real challenge, and I wasn't able to finish my degree because of the obstacles and, you know, financial aid and things like that. Also, I want to reiterate that um, we really don't need, I know it's a little off topic, we really don't need more DHS shelters. We really do need permanent safe housing because, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a lot to still deal with, you know. And and honestly, maybe we would solve the home, you know, this homeless epidemic if we didn't turn any more buildings into the shelters instead of instead of turning that, trying to turn that into a you know a independent housing opportunity, low income. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Afternoon, uh, Councilmember Chen. Um, thanks for uh, allowing me to testify. Um, I'm honored to be on a panel with uh, Kate and Ramon, um, and to be um, extremely appreciative to be here today. Uh, my name is Craig Hughes. I'm a social worker by profession. I've worked with homeless youth uh, for well over a decade. Um, also a researcher, and um, presenting in the capacity of a social worker and a researcher today. Um, I'm not going to read you the book that I handed into City Council. Um, although I uh, will highlight particular parts of it that I think should be um, made salient. Um, but I am going to start, uh, and I appreciate that DYCD is here to hear this, um, with a story from experience I had about two weeks ago. And this will be the one portion of the testimony I read. Um, and I do quote uh, DYCD testimony from the past at length. I will not do that. I will summarize that, um, but it's uh, in my testimony. Uh, so in the beginning of this testimony, I'd like to give an anecdote from my own recent experience. The anecdote is minor, but it might illustrate the haphazard way that the de Blasio administration has sought to aid homeless youth who survive in city streets. While working for a local agency, a colleague reached out to me because a young person seeking services through a social service program elsewhere in the city was trying to access an RHY bed and having difficulty. Unfortunately, the city has no sufficient central hotline or centralized emergency intake system for RHY beds. Rather, the policy is that a city official holds a cell phone and will take calls if a provider is having a difficult time finding a bed. Last year, in testimony before the council, the city official was here today uh, with DYCD testified to the following process for placing a homeless young person. I go into, I quoted the um, testimony from last year at length, um, but in that testimony he ended it with if a, hard, if a young person is having a hard time finding a bed or their advocate is having a hard time finding a bed, gave out his personal cell phone number. So on the afternoon that I'm referencing, the official was home with the phone sick. Uh, and as a, that's how I found that out later on via an email from the deputy commissioner who was also here today. 
Before finding that out, I called the cell phone number mentioned above um, early on testimony from both my work phone and my personal cell phone, but only a voicemail answered. I also called various D numbers in DYCD's RHY unit, and no one answered. I sent emails to DYCD's deputy commissioner and the official who testified today uh, and at that time to holding the relevant cell phone. Email and calls went unanswered until nearly two hours later. A second email I sent was only returned after I emailed the same DYCD officials and informed them that I had contacted Legal Aid about the issue. It took approximately, at that point, 14 minutes to get an answer to my emails. Suddenly, a city official was dispatched to find the young person abed. Clearly, we all get sick. City officials are extremely busy by the nature of their work. However, since city policy, as outlined in testimony here, is that this, that this cell phone is the route through which a bed can be found if someone is experiencing difficulty, clearly this is insufficient. This past weekend, while writing this testimony, uh, at about 1 in the morning, I work late, I called, and, uh, called the youth hotline um, that's on DYCD's website. Um, I, in hopes that I would be uh, clear on the process, if it's 1 in the morning, how a young person might get a bed. Um, I was routed to 311. Um, and I actually laid out the message that you get at 1 in the morning on a Saturday night. Uh, so what's that message saying? First, it's saying that someone seeking youth shelter is out of luck. Secondly, if they're in crisis, they can hang up and they refer to a national hotline. It's saying a lot of things, but it's certainly not saying, if you need a bed, here's a bed. Clearly, a business hours only hotline, which is what it's open now, uh, and an individual carrying a cell phone is not a sufficient intervention for linking homeless youth to youth-specific beds. Realistically, this is the smallest possible resource allocation the city can make, other than making no resource allocation. I go into detail about the need for a functional intake point, centralized place to get young people into beds, uh, and I go into detail about a lot of other things. I'm just going to finish off this uh, long-winded testimony uh, with a few of the gaps that are otherwise in the system. Uh, one that's come up repeatedly here uh, is the need for permanent housing system, uh, permanent housing assistance. Um, and I appreciate very much Kate's comments about uh, the struggles that young people in particular have in a gentrifying housing market. Uh, and young people have no subsidized way to exit homelessness in the city. To be just super clear, and Giselle from Coalition brought this up, there is no way out from these youth shelter system. And what you end up with then are young people who increase their survival behaviors to avoid the DHS system. Having no subsidized way out of shelter and no safe way to leave is a mechanism that churns out homelessness. As Ramon brought up, it's going to continue the growth of the, uh, the homeless population in the city. Um, there's some other issues that come up, and again, I'm happy that DYCD is here to hear this, um, in terms of data. Uh, the city, in its data to the state, uh, uh, in, in its report to OCFS for its annual funding, uh, states that it uh, depends on its measures management report data um, in terms of its, the presentation of its system. And if you look at its mayor management report data, which came out not too long ago, 2017, data, um, you would think that the system is working miraculously well. Um, for example, just so I can uh, bear with me as I pull this up here. <sighs> Sorry for the hold. I'm just trying to find the page. Again, I wrote a book. Um, according to FOIL data, well, actually, let me see. Uh, MRR data, MMR data states uh, for 2017 that 88% of youth discharged from till beds were, quote, reunited with family or placed in a suitable environment from, uh, uh, from the till beds. However, data that I foiled shows that only a total of 68 of 445 duplicated discharges from till beds returned home. Similarly, from crisis beds, DYCD reports in the MMR data that 77% re, quote, reunited with family or placed in a suitable environment from the crisis shelters. However, data, data produced by DYCD and FOIL requests tells a very different story. What we end up with is a story where DYCD is overplaying its success in helping young people exit homelessness. What the data, and it's in my testimony uh, from FOIL documents shows, is that DYCD overwhelmingly churns young people into the street or into unknown locations or back into crisis shelters. Unfortunately, both the uh, lack of access to rental subsidies and to permanent supportive housing, um, because young people unfortunately are uh, disproportionately unable to access it due to various barriers um, at the provider level, uh, young people do not sustainably leave homelessness from the DYCD system. So in, in closing this up here, just a few things about the bills. Uh, it's 
fantastic that we've come this far, and I, I'm honored to be in a room with some people who created the history of homeless youth services uh, in this city. Um, with that said, uh, Councilmember Johnson's bill, or Speaker Johnson's bill, uh, was better last time. Um, at that point, Speaker Johnson was calling for a right to shelter. What we've seen now is a walk away from a right to shelter demand. There is possibly nothing more important in this city in terms of homeless youth and solving youth homelessness than ensuring that young people are embraced by the city and not churned out in the street. And a walk away from a right to shelter is the wrong point of compromise. The point of compromise starts from the agreement that a right to shelter is necessary. Not that we need a, com a compliance plan or a capacity plan that is based on often faulty data, utterly failed methodologies for counting youth on the street, and relies on turn away after youth engage the system. The starting point is creating a right to shelter not backtracking from it. And I hope that there's some reconsideration to stand up to the mayor and the demands by DYCD for an austere budget, um, or let me restate that, uh, the demands for the city to have an austere budget, which DYCD then tends, obviously justifies, um, and rather we need an expansive budget that creates a right to shelter on demand as young people need it. Thank you. Oh, okay. Well, thank you to this panel, and thank you for your advocacy, and thank you for being here today. Um, okay, we have two more. We have um, Norma Felispino, and uh, also Judy Fernandez from Chelsea for you. It was on, now, now it's on. Hi, good afternoon, my name is Jody Fernandez. I'm a part of the Chelsea Fourier program, which is um, RHY. Uh, well, my background story is since last February, I've been homeless. And uh, gratefully, since I found Chelsea Fourier, now I have stability and shelter. But the problem is, the problem is when they accepted me in August, I was already 19, and in, my birthday is in August, so basically the week after I was accepted, I was already 20. Now, basically being that since at the age of 21, they have to discharge me, basically I'm panicking and worrying since my birthday is in August, this upcoming August, now I have to find shelter. I, since being in the program, I've been in high school and now I'm graduating in two days, but instead of kind of celebrating and, oh yeah, I'm graduating, I, I am celebrating, but at the same time, I'm worried about where I'm gonna go in August because I have no, basically my supportive system is Chelsea Ford. They're my, you know, the staff is my family at this moment. So since I'm kind of worried about losing that supportive system in upcoming August, my plan was to basically go into college and for business management as my major and take some graphic designing classes. And eventually when I graduate from there, I would uh, be able to open up my own, own business and, but. I would need this bill to be passed so I could have that time to actually graduate and be su successful. And if this bill doesn't pass, then basically I'm another kid recycling into being into basically being homeless again. So just I, I hope you guys make this go through. And yeah, thank you for letting me speak in today. Hi, how are you? My name is Norma. Um, first, I'd like to start off that I'm extremely nervous, so I would like to thank um, all of you guys for coming. I'd also like to say that um, I'm speaking on behalf of all the Good Shepherd services and residents and everybody that couldn't make it today. Um, a little bit about me is that um, I'm 20 years old, but 
like Jody, I am going to be 21 in August, and it's literally been a year and a half. And, um, you know, I only have my sister in this country. First, I'd like to say that um, I'd like to thank, thank all of you for this opportunity. And I've been dying to tell somebody, at least telling somebody, you know, so I can be heard. Because I know it's just not going to happen, you know. Um, it's been pretty hard. Um, I'm the first generation American. And my mom has not been in this country for 11 years. So I've been raised by someone who's a decade over, older than me. I haven't been in foster care. I've been under my sister's care until 16 maybe. And then she kicked me out. So kind of like what other panelists have been saying, I've been couch surfing. I've been, you know, looking at other people's houses, but the shelter has never been an option for me. And that's because I knew from stories that it was dangerous, people fight, and, you know, I think we're all fighting for the same thing. And, you know, that's financial freedom. That's being able to just be around your family. And it's been hard for me especially because, um, you know, if maybe other things have been passed, maybe my sister would not have to work in a I'm just going to be honest. I'm just going to be blunt with you guys. At least my sister probably wouldn't have to work in a strip club, you know, and that has been such a really bad example for me because if things were more um, widely expressed, widely known, maybe everybody else would have the same opportunity that we do, and I think we do need to start with the youth. We need to start with people who are pregnant, people who do have kids, you know, because then that would give them a bright future. And I think that really, really matters because, you know, my sister has no way of finding another job. That's the only thing she knows. And, you know, I come from that. But I, I like, separated myself from that. And I wanted to go to college. And I wanted to, you know, be a doctor. You know, I really wish I could. But given the circumstances, all I really wanted was somebody to listen, someone like you, you know, to just hear me out and say, wow, she hasn't had her mom here. And, you know, I don't want a pity, like, I don't want anybody to feel bad for me because me growing through this, I've been through, um, you know, working as a direct support professional, and I've heard stories way worse than mine. I mean, you know, it needs to be separated for homeless youth. It needs to be separated for the disabled because they go through that too. And, you know, they go through rape. They go through homelessness. They go through things that is unimaginable. And I would just like to express the need for all of us to at least have somewhere to lay our heads down and somewhere to eat, you know, at least a table to eat. I eat on my bed, but I just feel like everybody needs to eat. Everybody needs to have three times a day they need to eat meals. They need to have some sort of comfort. And the thing for the shelters, I, I really want to push that it should be 24 hours because at any time of the day, anybody could get kicked out. And I know that. And I know, I know that hands on. I feel like some people who are pushing a bill and they haven't gone through homelessness, they don't know. They don't know hands on. They don't have the experience. They, don't, they haven't gone through that. But, you know, I'm telling you from someone who's been through it that it needs to happen. And, uh, you know, it's not easy. So it's easier said than, you know, going through it. Um, but, you know, I think that shelter systems need to have heavier security as well so that way people don't get hurt. Um, you know, I was diagnosed with epilepsy since 14. And I had a seizure right outside the shelter. And, you know, nobody was there to help me. You know, I mean, after there was residents passing by and they saw. But, you know, I think there needs to be more security. And there just needs people, there needs to be people that care. And, you know, unfortunately, we live in a tough city. And I think if we implement that, that it can happen. And we, we can do it together. Like, teamwork makes the dream work. So, 
you know, I appreciate all of you listening, and, you know, hopefully this really happens. Thank you so much. And thank you, both of you, for testifying and, and coming today and sharing your stories. Um, we're going to work very hard to get these legislation passed. The fact that we are hearing uh, these legislation so soon is because we have a strong supporter um, in our speaker. So I'm very confident that we will get it passed as soon as possible. And I really urge uh, the provider, gear up, so that we can provide services for our youth that need them. And thank you to all of you uh, for coming today to share your story, to testify, and thank you to all the advocates out there for your great work. Um, can, can I add something? Yes. Uh, also, um, since I'm leaving, well, I have to leave in August because I'm turning 21, there are no services for me, like people like me, be because I have no disabilities. I, ha I don't have HIV or any of that, like, you know, needs. Basically, there are no services for, like, basically, I don't have disabilities, so basically there's nowhere that, nowhere that anybody could help me, basically, so, yeah, there's no supportive system, there's no system that, oh, yeah, you could, we couldn't refer you to here, no, it's basically, oh, you have to work hard and basically pay rent, and the rent in <laughs> New York is crazy, so basically... Also, uh, like friends and people I know, they're 25, 24, they're not even ready to move out. So what do you think somebody at the age of 21 and has no family, no people supporting them, it's not going to be ready? So basically, that, that's all I have to say. Thank you for hearing. But don't be hopeless, okay? Because we're going to work to get the legislation passed so that you can continue to get the good services that you have now, okay? So study hard and, and do well in school. Thank All right, you. Thank you everyone for being here today. Uh, the hearing is adjourned.